everyone everyone here with us today um to 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 join us so today's agenda is right now for the next 20 minutes is the opening remarks and meet the panel uh after that we're going to start with the presentation slash pitches um one o'clock to two ten eastern is the open topic um two ten to three o'clock is going to be additive manufacturing and composites and then three o'clock to four o'clock is going to be semiconductors and nanotechnology. Um, the vision of Deep Tech Showcase is to bring more deep tech to market by leveraging the power of community. Um, how this makes sense is basically there's a lot of scientific founders out there. There's a lot of tech out there that's really relevant um, in more ways than just one. Uh, and what we found is that getting the people who, who, who really need that tech Getting, getting it to them has been more difficult than, than one would think. So what Deep Tech Showcase is doing, it creates an ecosystem to allow you know, the newest innovations to be shared uh, among, among the community and allow for things to proliferate far faster than they would otherwise. Um, and so here's the ecosystem. It consists of startups, tech scouts, both from government and corporations, and as well as investors. Uh, anchoring the showcases are basically the showcases themselves, the events. So uh, what we're focusing on are different themes tonight is today is advanced materials. Uh, next next showcase in October is gonna be related on to space and space technologies. After that, we are going to have an interesting showcase focused on AppWorks, but essentially it's in order to have, to, to talk about in each industry and have a session for that industry that we can hone in and zoom in on. At, between the showcases, we're always happy to make introductions. So if anyone sees a company here today that seems interesting, they wanna to talk to, they don't know how to get in touch with, feel free to email um, myself and or Brian. Uh, we're always happy to, to help foster introductions. That's our goal. And in between the showcases, if, <clears throat> if you're an investor or corporate tech scout and you are looking for, for more for more deal flow, more companies to work with, we're happy to do to there for you guys and, and happy to make an introduction, introduce ourselves and, and work with you. So as I mentioned, I already mentioned this, but these are upcoming three showcases, um, space, autonomous systems, and then there's gonna be an AppWorks showcase for the D2P2, uh, assuming that everything passes through, uh, through Congress. All right. I'd like to quickly introduce Matthew Cloud I'm from our sister company, Eagle Point Funding. Uh, Matthew's going to give us some, some updates and information on upcoming solicitations. How yep. to work with hi, uh, thanks, Asher. Um, hi, everybody. Um, like Asher said, I'm Matthew Cloud. I'm, uh, I, 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 I work in the business development department here at Eagle Point Funding. Um, we work very closely in conjunction with the Deep Tech Showcase. In fact, most of our clients are here pitching today. Um, and uh, so what we are is we are a, uh, at a very high level, a grant consultancy firm uh, that uh, spearheads the submission process uh, when it comes to proposal preparation, uh, opportunity identification, uh, and, and so forth. Um, I just some of the, uh, I mean, there's a lot of excitement happening, as Asha had mentioned, uh, you know, with the with the new reforms to the SBIR program, uh, you know, there's been a lot of buzz around it, um, and we're actually we're very excited to uh, to see the finalized results, which did happen uh, today, um, you know, from the House of Representatives. So um, uh, that being said, there's uh, there's a lot of stuff that's currently active right now with all of the new, all of the new acts and uh, you know and reforms and bills uh, that have been recently passed, uh, whether it's like the Chips Act or the um, uh, you know, or the or the infrastructure bill, or the clean energy bill, things like this. Um, you know, so here are just uh, some examples of uh, some of the solicitations that we are going after uh, for our clients uh, from the Navy uh, at the end of uh, the end of last month, or actually, I think it was just a, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the Naval Service Warfare Center uh, released a, a one-year broad agency announcement for uh, uh, corrosion and coatings. Um, we have the USDA Small Business Innovation Research Fund Phase One, uh, which is which we're submitting to uh, by I believe October 25th. 
Um, and then we have the, uh, the Advanced Manufacturing Office uh, Industrial Efficiency and Decarbonization Funding Opportunity Announcement from the, uh, from the Office for Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energies Office at the DOE. There's a lot of really great stuff in there. Um, uh, coming soon, uh, you know, like it, Asher had mentioned, uh, you know, if, as long as everything pans out, uh, we're expecting a directed phase two solicitation from the U.S. Air Force, uh, AFWORKS Afwork, open topic, um, which, uh, which will be in November. Um, we do also have not pictured here, uh, which is currently active. We have the Army XTech search uh, open topic, which uh, actually just released two days ago. So that's uh, you know lots of exciting stuff. We also have more from the Advanced Manufacturing Office at the DOE. Um, you know if you guys would, if you if you have any questions or would like to book a call or hear more about uh, uh, more about what we do or uh, you know applicability of your specific company, you can shoot me an email at matthew at eaglepointfunding.com, or you can uh, scan this QR code here to uh, book a call directly with my team. Back to you, Asher. Awesome. Thank you so much, Matthew. And um, if you could, would you mind putting your Calendly link in the chat? So everyone, in case that some people are not as good with QR codes or might have sure. uh, some, yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. You got it. All right. And, and speaking of Matthew Cloud, um, we are hosting a new initiative called Ask Me Anything, uh, hosted by Deep Tech Showcase, where we're going to be interviewing uh, relevant stakeholders from the DOD, corporations, uh, and coming soon, investors. And Matthew Cloud is going to be hosting the first one, along with Art Trevithan from the Army Applications Laboratory. So it should be a really exciting event. Uh, feel free to tune in on October 18th. The reason it's called Ask Me Anything is because you can also ask Art questions uh, at the end of it. So if you have anything that you're curious about in terms of the Army Applications Laboratory, join join there it's going to be a great event next up we have as another new initiative we have is the mou club um not new but it, it came back around uh, with the release of the next afworks uh, cycle we will be hosting a, a a gathering essentially of 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 the companies that are looking to get a air force end user in order to be able to either be applicable to a phase two or a direct to phase two. And now back to the showcase today, we're gonna to start off with the open topic and leading the open topic is gonna to be beep up sensors um, followed by blast wave technologies. After that, undefined technologies and then nanosent. We're gonna to get to the additive manufacturing and composites when we get there and as well as semiconductors and nanotech. All right, so I'm quickly going to introduce the open topic panel. Feel free to introduce yourself, your name, um, what what company you're from, or wh where you're working right now, as well as uh, an interesting uh, what 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 technology is the most the most interesting upcoming you know deep tech technology for you. Um, so Warner, you want to kick it off? Yeah, sure. It's always good to be first. You can set the bar low. Um, everybody calls me DC. I'm Warner Paredes, stationed out at Robbins Air Force Base. I'm an AFWERX fellow and a Defense Ventures fellow. Um, I specialize in airfield operations. So what interests me the most is uh, anything that's uh, deployable systems for air traffic control, ground radar systems. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us, Warner. Uh, next up, we have Ann Mara. Hi, uh, good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, everyone. Thank you so much, Asher, again, for pulling an amazing set of panelists together. Um, happy to be uh, sitting alongside many of you here virtually, and uh, it definitely can speak as a, provide a testimonial to how great Eagle Point funding is and uh, Deep Tech Showcase. Um, they are definitely your go-to resource in helping grow uh, your businesses on the federal government side of the house as you look to expand, uh, you know, your your footprint as well as um, uh, gaining market share both on the commercial and on the government side. Um, I lead uh, data and AI uh, for Splunk, and Splunk is a three and a half billion dollar publicly traded 
uh, data to everything company. So what's of most interest uh, to me and to our organization is um, applying a platform that allows you to work with n amounts of data across n data sources and data types and happy to learn more uh, about the various um, startups that are going to be presenting here today and feel free uh, to reach out to Asher with my contact. I am currently uh, on a sabbatical with Harvard Medical School and working with the father of synthetic biology on everything uh, in terms of biological and nuclear threats that we believe are going to, uh, in some way, shape or form, uh, follow this unfortunate COVID pandemic we've all realized. Not to put a damper on the conversation, but really looking forward to learning and, and growing and, and sharing more. Thank, Thank you, you, Asher. Thank you so much, Anne. Thank you so much. All right, next up we have Samira from G7 Ventures. Hi everyone, this is Samira, indeed, G. <laughs> Curtis. I have multiple hats, so I'm a managing director of EIT, stands for European Institution for Innovation and Technology, and I'm also founder of G7 Ventures, so. <laughs> awesome, thank you so much for joining us, Samira. And then next up from Pinjia, we have Matthew Cohen. Hi everybody, Matt Cohen of uh, Pangea, as Asher mentioned, excited to, to be here and um, very quickly, Pangea Ventures, we're a venture capital firm and really we focus a lot on supporting companies commercializing advanced materials and advanced material process kinds of innovations. So this showcase is, uh, is certainly right up our alley today. Perfect, thank you for joining us, Matt. All right, next up, Jacob Rice. Yeah, hi, um, I'm based in Israel, working as a venture partner um, or Hinkle, um, uh, Hinkle Adhesives, um, B2B chemistry world leader in um, uh, adhesives and um, a wide range of other advanced material products. Um, I have a multiple hat, so I'm also the venture partner in Israel for um, Eastman Chemical. Uh, especially, um, with, um, particularly um, specializing in uh, polymer films. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jacob. Uh, next up, we have Mark Greek. Hi, I'm Mark Greco with the Chemical Angel Network. And Chemical Angels is an angel network, just like any other angel network, a group of accredited investors. What makes us different is we look for companies with a chemistry-focused value proposition, and we invest across materials, measurement, manufacturing, kind of three apps. Awesome. awesome. Thank you, Mark. All right, next, Maureen from Corbion. Yep. Hi, everyone. I'm I'm Maureen Kunis, uh, for short, and I am from Corbion. I'm the director of Open Innovation there. Uh, Corbion's a Dutch company, and so we focus on clean uh, food ingredients and bio-based materials. Um, and because it's sort of the core of the technology we we leverage at Corbion, I'm really excited about all these uh, applications and companies that are doing cool things with fermentation. Awesome. That, perfect, thank you, Maureen. Um, next up is Olivier Demain from Kineo Finance. Hey everyone, it's Olivier Demain from Kineo Finance. Kineo Finance, basically, it's a global financing partner. We help deep tech companies, startups to scale, to grow by basically increasing the market adoption of their product. We basically emperor um, has a service business model such as hardware or software with non dilutive innovative fast financing solution. Uh, we have venture leasing solution, a rev revenue based financing. We typically, typically work with robotic, IoT supply chain, metric, and environmental engineering startup and can invest tickets from five to 100 million. And we also have a VC arm that is used as an add on for financing uh, solution and invest ticket from 300K to 3 million. Um, one, one, one technology I'm looking at that um, I find it very fascinating at the moment is the whole standardization that you see uh, within the robotic market. So you see uh, small pieces such as uh, uh, LIDAR or 3D camera or sensor that can be basically plug, plug and play to, to uh, various different robots. So that's really it from me. Yeah, that, that's always been really cool. I, I remember when, you know, I think one of the companies made a modular phone. It never yeah. caught. I don't think it caught, but there was a lot of buzz, which was really cool that you could just add a camera to it. Yes, exactly. That's awesome. All right. Thank you, Olivia. 
Next up, we have Ian Liu from Hypertherm. Hi, everyone. I'm from uh, Hypertherm Ventures. So, Hypertherm is a global leader in industrial cutting, and our venture team basically invests in early stage deep tech startups that have industrial applications. So, think about like industrial items, robotics, or uh, in the for today's case, uh, you know, added manufacturing and the materials that, they, uh, that go into that. Uh, specifically for us, metal and composite are. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Alana from Autodesk. Hello, my name is Alana Monkunsavat. I am a research development manager for Autodesk Research. Autodesk is a software company based out of San Francisco, and we have three major pillars within our organization. One is media and entertainment, another is manufacturing, and the last being architecture, engineering, and construction. I specialize in manufacturing, and I'm very excited to learn more about the technologies being demonstrated today. Thank sure. you, Asher. Absolutely, thank you for joining us. And so we have a few other panelists uh, and panels. We will get to those uh, when we get to them. Uh, now, I would like to invite Keith from EPOP Sensors to uh, start getting his slides ready because um, you are up. You're, you're muted, Keith. Uh, am I sharing from my yeah. computer? Yep, yeah. on your end, exactly. Okay. Uh, let's make you bigger. Everyone good? Yep, we can hear and see you. Can't ask for much more than that. Um, Keith McMillan, founder of Bebop Sensors. Uh, we're the world's leader in fabric-based sensors. Um, we can provide the missing data. We're focusing on digital health and robotics. Robots use cameras, but as a robotic hand moves into position, the camera can't see what it's touching. So we're like a second skin. Uh, we can provide great tactile information, uh, which I hopefully can demonstrate. Uh, we also uh, deliver digital health data, insoles. Uh, so much can be discerned from how someone's walking. And we have programs going with major warehouse companies uh, and other companies for health. And I think everyone wants to reduce their health costs and keep their workforce happy. Um, 33 patents issued. Uh, we're looking to raise 10 million uh, with some of that secured and uh, looking for an MOU to help us integrate our robotic end effectors and or uh, insoles into other types of applications. So this is a fabric sensor. I'm gonna show you is a piece of fabric and then we print traces on the other side. This is a 256 by 256, excuse me, this is a 256 sensor device. You can see it here. It can be wrapped around any surface. It's conformal. Essentially, we take a uh, non-woven, which is basically felt material, and we ionically bond carbon nanoparticles to the outside of the fibers. And as the fibers are engaged more together or pulled further apart, the ability to conduct electricity changes. So all we do is we put a current in and pull a voltage out, and it gives us a remarkably accurate and high dynamic range sensors. Here we go. Fits any surface. Uh, we can get down to one millimeter resolution. The fabric itself is half a millimeter thick, but you, the sensor stacks is usually one millimeter. It's got a huge dynamic range. I developed these originally for musical instruments. Uh, it's greater than 80 dB. That's five orders of magnitude, which is like three to four orders of magnitude more than the other types of sensors. We can sense five grams to 150 kilograms. And uh, it's exceedingly fast. It can do a 67 dB change in one millisecond. And it's stable over time. And it's very affordable. It's one of uh, my favorite sensors. Uh, it can be used in robotics. 
um, we're seeing just that wonderful part of the curve where humanoid robotics are starting to take off. Um, and, you know, many of the problems are near solved, uh, cameras for eyes, microphones for ears, uh, GATO uh, IA uh, integrates language with vision, with kinetics, so it's basically what we can do. Also, we can provide advanced grippers for uh, interfacing with any type of object and or remote uh, telepresence for defusing bombs is a good example. Um, the insole, which I'll show here, is made simply of fabric sensors, and these can be placed into any insole or into a shoe itself. It gives you really accurate data about how you're walking. And a lot of times, if you go to see a doctor, they'll ask you to walk to the table and back. And there are uh, studies out there that say they can predict a stroke 48 hours in advance just based upon your gait. Uh, so while watches are fantastic for all kinds of data, uh, how you walk really is a great indicator of your well-being. Um, this can be used for people who are in warehousing, uh, ground crew, any anyone that has uh requirements to be able to move around and be responsive and to be in known good shape um founder me uh francois judeau uh is our ceo started about four months ago um he has sold several companies uh including the last one to Kemet. i myself have started and sold multiple companies the last one to polycom poly we've got a great team um and uh, skills in many areas, a uh, lot of recognition. Um, we were uh, an SBIR phase two a couple years ago, and would like to enter again with our new technologies and uh, looking for an MOU. Um, now I'm going to be a little bit, uh, brave here and try to uh, see if I can do a live demo. How much time I got? We're a little over already, but give it a, give ah, it a shot. Okay. Uh, okay, so this is our robot finger. You can see that, I hope. It's very small. Yep. And so I'm just going to squeeze on it. And you can see each of the little nerves reacting down there. And uh, each of those sensors, there's 80 of them, uh, goes from uh, less than five grams to over 50 kilograms. So this exceeds human ability, both in spatial resolution and in force response. So that was my excitement for the day. Thank you all very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Keith. That was fantastic. Um, and already already has a question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually have a couple and, and thank you so much. That was a great presentation as well as the the, the demo. Um, one overarching question, I don't think I heard anything as in terms of uh, the ability to handle uh, high or extreme temperatures, either on the low or the high end. Uh, so if you could talk to that. And then also, um, what was your uh, what was your time to market from um, concept to acquisition in the in the previous the uh your your previous venture that was acquired by polycom thank you um uh the company uh that i sold to polycom uh i had a five-year plan and i missed it by five months so it took five years five months to, to sell that company so um that i felt quite good everyone was happy I was able to take three years off and play music. So I was ecstatic. And was there another question in there? How long does it take? Uh, the, the, the heat, the extreme uh, the weather. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we, we can go from uh, minus 40 to 100 C. Um, and that's with our standard fabric. We've also 
made sensors out of Kevlar, Nomex, uh, other materials that have a greater temperature range. It's our base fabric, which is a polyester nylon, uh, which limits the temperature range. Thank you. Absolutely. Maureen, you're up. Keith, um, really exciting as you were presenting uh, all the potential applications were like dancing through my head. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, just in digital health, you have a lot of opportunity around diabetic foot ulcers, bed sores, to all sorts of things like that. So how do you plan to kind of get into a lot of these opportunities, you know, a lot of different form factors? Are you thinking about licensing your technology to others or building sort of your own portfolio of end use um, applications? Well, we've uh, built proofs of concepts for a variety of uh, problems. Uh, many of them did not have uh, business follow through. Um, so we're focusing on the two high growth markets uh, that we're familiar with, which is robotics and digital health. Um, we have a, a, a deep library of firmware, software, and sensor design. Uh, the company we're building the warehouse sensor for, uh, we're spinning up a new version. It'll take mm, six weeks. Uh, we've been working with them for a while, and they've tested every sensor on the market and picked us. So our ability to modify is uh, one of our great strengths. Um, it's a fabric sensor, and I'll uh, distort the analogy. We consider ourselves like tailors. You can come in and say, I want a suit, and we say two-piece, three-piece, which color? So if someone wants a robot finger that's wider or narrower or uh, has other characteristics, like my gardener's hand feels very different than the person who cuts my hair. So we can make skin that has different textures and different types of um, responsiveness for grip and sensitivity. And we can prototype all of that in our lab in Berkeley. So we can make the first 20 or 30 pieces ourselves. Then we usually will build for the company. We have CMs who have made hundreds of thousands of products with about 4 million sensors in them. And then we do licensing. Uh, so depending upon the amount of IP, we'll set a license fee and we'll sell them fabric. So we have a very nice relationship and a feedback loop in their county. Awesome, awesome. And last question, Olivier. Uh, yeah, um, thanks a lot. Uh, one question I know you um, basically show a, a comparison in terms of technology versus your competitors but from a business perspective. How would you uh, basically position yourself versus, um, I know one of, of them in Finland. I don't know if you know Kanati. I know there is some funds there recently, and I know they are around since quite some years, I think more than 10 years. So how, how would you look at those companies that are already out there since quite a while, raised quite some funds, and then are um, is, having already traction? Is this in robotics or health? Yes, in robotics. Um, and their company name again? Uh, Kanati. I can't say I'm totally familiar with them. Okay. Uh, we we have looked at most of the competition of uh, merit that are being used. Uh, the best selling uh, digital hand out there now is from Shadow, and mm -hmm. uh, they're working with Haptics on a telerobotic system, and we're engaged uh, with the valuations for sensors for that uh, hand, the shadow hand. Um, yeah, I, I just am not aware of anything that has multiple points, that basically that is more human than human in terms of its responsiveness. Okay. I, I would certainly like, if you could send me a link, I would certainly like to be aware of this company. Yeah, sure, uh, let's connect. We can discuss further. Sure. Awesome, thank you so much, Keith. Um, Thanks, everybody. That was awesome. Next up, we have Tom Sego presenting for Blastwave Technologies. Tom, the floor is yours. Welcome, everybody. I'm Tom Sego, co-founder and CEO of Blastwave, and I'm here to talk about Zero Trust. 
um, our company simplifies the security stack um, by focusing on prevention uh, to protect your critical assets from the most pernicious cyber threats. We were founded in 2017. Um, I'm going to hit play, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and, you know, the other thing that's going on in the world, obviously, is everything is getting digitized, everything has a chip, and those devices are worthless unless they're connected, but every time you connect a device, it creates a path for harm, and BlastWave and Blast Shield makes that connectivity safe. So people are aware that cyber is a problem, but the magnitude and direction are sometimes jarring. Spending's going up double digits. And, but yet ransomware and the cost of cyber insurance is almost go growing triple digit year over year. So what we're doing is not working. And so what we're doing is we're trying to focus on protection prevention um, because we believe that zero trust is really a strategy that puts prevention into practice. And that's what we're doing. So what we do in addition to doing secure encrypted transport, we try to eliminate the top three ways that hackers establish a beachhead in your environment. And the first thing we do is we get rid of credentials. There's no usernames or passwords. We have multi-factor authentication. There's no SMS six digit codes that get sent. There's no push notifications. And so we eliminate that as a, as a threat vector. Furthermore, we do not have a single public facing TCP port. There's no exposed web services, so people cannot exploit remotely bugs, CVEs, and zero-day viruses. And then we also uh, make the configuration process so dirt simple. It's just copy and paste that we eliminate a lot of that human error. So at the end of the day, we are much, we make our customers much harder to attack. And, and typically uh, nefarious actors are just gonna move on to a softer target. So here's an example of some customers and use cases that we have. We have a customer that basically allows uh, remote connectivity to manage artificial intelligence fuel pricing. We have, uh, we secure drone operations. We secure logistics, um, the largest uh, refrigerated and frozen food uh, storage company in the world, as well as a implanted medical device company. So we have a lot of different use cases. Now here's the kind of money slide in a way you're probably all familiar with VPN. 25 years ago, this was the standard when we had this castle moat architecture. You'd have your users connect into a VPN concentrator that would then allow access to those applications on site. If you wanted to manage things between sites, you had to set up site-to-site -site VPNs and that suffered slow performance, drop connections, all kinds of security issues. But in Around, around 2010, once we started having more people move to the cloud, VPN really didn't address the issue for SaaS apps and cloud provided applications. So you introduce companies like Zscaler who now moved that VPN concentrator to a cloud hosted proxy server that allowed people to remotely access those services. Um, now this was a step forward. It enabled connectivity to the cloud but it still didn't address what I call the original sin uh, of security, which is usernames and passwords. And so this didn't do anything to address phishing um, with MFA. Uh, furthermore, all of that traffic hairpins through those proxy servers, creating tremendous bottlenecks. And I've got a slide on performance in a bit. So what we've done is we've moved to a peer-to-peer -peer architecture that you have full mesh capabilities, any to any, it's extremely high performance. We end up cloaking these devices so they're unscannable from the outside or even the inside. Um, and you have to have permissions to see or access anything. And then we add in phishing resistant multi-factor authentication. Like I said, I spent a decade at Apple and so it's patterned after Apple Pay in terms of the user experience. And then we also get rid of certificates and it's very easy to manage. So I mentioned performance in terms of the uh, solution itself, we're somewhere between two and 34 times faster than the competition. Perimeter 81, for example, is a classic SASE kind of company. And so 34 times faster than that. Um, we're also six to seven times faster in terms of uh, site to site or workload to workload throughput. Now, let's talk a little bit about what the solution really is. So there's, there's really four main components. 
The first two are the handshake that allow the authentication process to take place. And this is a client and an authenticator on your mobile device. We also have an orchestrator that allows you to manage groups and policies, and it enforces these in real time so you can provision and revoke instantaneously. And then the fourth component are these agents that can be loaded either on uh, devices that have modern operating systems, or in the case of industrial IoT, you can put them on commodity hardware or virtual machines and allow them to protect and isolate and cloak those uh, digital devices. So here's an example of what that looks like with um, CCTVs. Uh, you essentially put an agent on the, 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 uh, the NVR that then streams the video to AWS and you can remotely manage that. You can only see and again, access what you're supposed to. And then general, more generally speaking, this is like Lego building blocks in that there's a, there's a lot of power in how you can put these together to configure to your topology. This is what the, the orchestrator looks like and you can just see how you're able to manage unidirectional control between groups of users or devices to other users or devices. And it's basically drag and drop uh, simplicity. Now, let me move on to the business model because oftentimes we don't talk about that. We're so enamored with the product, we don't talk about the business model. A lot of SaaS companies have a land and expand business model. Ours is a land and expand spread model. So a lot of companies will land, gain a toehold, expand to other departments or other use cases. Uh, and then what we do is we spread to other companies based on the fact that supply chain risk, like what happened with SolarWinds, means it's in your best interest to have your ecosystem using Blast Shield as well. Um, our go -to morning. Okay, yeah. Our go-to-market strategy is product-led growth is one uh, thrust. Another pillar is direct sales team. A third is partnership with cyber insurance carriers and MSPs. And then the third is to partner with key players who offer complementary solutions, and then we can kind of beat Cisco Palo Alto Networks. This is the team. We've got deep expertise in networking, cybersecurity, and also um, uh, I, I'm a kind of a jack of all trades, so I've had experience in a lot of different things. So at the end, so so the the product roadmap is we're adding things in uh, redundancy, resilience, um, the industrial sector, and we're going to be expanding integrations. So the the bottom line is is we keep the bad guys out and we stop the spread. Um, we're faster, we're simpler, we're easier to use, and we've got an innovative business model and go-to-market strategy. Thank you. Awesome, awesome, thank you. Thank you so, so much, Tom. All right, Ken, you're up again. Yeah, thank you, thanks so much. Uh, great job again, um, really good presentation. Uh, I like the idea of taking Palo Alto, Palo Alto out uh, in, in some sense that <laughs> they are a Splunk competitor, but actually I think what has happened is at least in the last two years because of this pandemic, a lot of the tech companies have actually fallen uh, in terms of product innovation, ingenuity and development, because as we all know, uh, to continue to evolve a product set actually does require you to be physically uh, in a lab and uh, collaborating with other um, bright-minded innovators in the room. And unfortunately the pandemic prevented that from happening. Uh, so I think you've got a really good opportunity here uh, to perhaps uh, take a quantum leap. I'm interested to know, uh, and I believe you mentioned uh, Palo Alto as one potential uh, takeout opportunity. I like the idea of the spread. Uh, that you shared that was uh, absolutely innovative and creative. So thanks to you for doing that. Um, tell us a little bit about, unless I miss this, around patents. Uh, you know, your, your technology, how patented is it? And then what type of moat do you have? Thank you. So we have a patent. It's been granted. It's not patent pending. And um, it basically helps uh, kind of protect the peer-to-peer -peer architecture and the mechanism we use to create to allow each of these nodes to beacon and self bind to create this unified fabric. So it's it we we've tried to patent as much of the secret sauce as we could. The the really interesting thing is as I look at our stack today, I need to get busy filing some more patents because we've created a lot more innovation between the time we got this one 
filed and now. Great, if I may just add to that. So the one thing as I'm sure you already know, being a serial entrepreneur yourself is uh, while there is something to be said about getting your secret sauce patented, there's also that sort of fine line that you have to walk to make sure that it's, it's not necessarily given away in the application because you don't want your competition to know uh, that these are some of the architectures that you're already uh, incorporating into your product set because it's easier uh, for Apollo, as an example, to just throw money uh, at it and, and probably trump you as well. Yeah, and yeah. I'll tell you that that is you you hit on the number one thing that keeps me up at night. It's how do we move with blazing speed to take advantage of our innovation uh, advantage while and try to gain distribution. So I'm trying to gain distribution as absolutely fast as I can um, uh, before the other players catch up. Yeah. So one, uh, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't mean to. Um... Uh, take over this conversation here, but we could definitely talk offline. Uh, definitely have some ideas on that. Um, I think what you okay, have great. to do is, yeah, d yeah, well, yeah, okay. happy to, to reconnect. Yeah, thank you. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so um, much, Ann. All right, Jacob, you're up. Yeah, just in terms of other players, I've seen Ciolo, um, Perimeter, 80, and Perimeter 81 in Israel, and Sage security in the US, all doing zero trust, somewhat similar, all of them to what you described. So it seems like that's the market where um, uh, it's already happening. And uh, how do you um, differentiate yourself from the others doing the same thing? Well, um, I think from a standpoint of, let's just take Perimeter 81, for example. So they are using this cloud hosted proxy server model. The performance that report that came out last week demonstrated that we were 34 times faster than Perimeter 81. Would you consider that a competitive advantage? I mean, it's, it's, it's significant. And I think architecturally, there are things that they are way behind on. Um, they are not as flexible. They're not as easy to use. Uh, we run into them in many different customer engagements. And what we hear is we don't like Primer 81. Um, we're looking for alternatives that can perform better and that are more flexible. So um, that's what I would say about Primer 81. And the uh, Sayolo and uh, Israeli XA, uh, XAGE security, it's US. So I don't know about Sayolo. Kao, do you know, you know who they are? Uh, yeah, and I also am familiar with Sage uh, that uses blockchain um, in their deployments for OT. So, you know, the, the big differences here are that the companies like Perimeter 81, uh, and there, there are a few others, they're still, they, they've basically taken the VPN model and moved it into the cloud. You still have all of the same problems of bottlenecks and all of that. They've also done another thing, which which we do very differently, which is, they rely on you to bring your own identity platform. So for example, you know, bring your Microsoft and Google login. Uh, so you have to pay for that as well. We incorporate phishing resistant MFA into the product as part of the solution. So we're really solving a number of different problems. We're allowing them to abide by the uh, increasing zero trust and uh, phishing resistant requirements by the US government. We're allowing them to simplify their security architecture and move from cloud-based and centralized to a more peer-to-peer -peer direct full mesh, which is very high performance. And then thirdly, we're, um, uh, we're allowing these firms to get rid of a lot of other security that they have layered and stacked up that you really don't need as much of when you migrate to this platform of being able to absolutely know who the client is and absolutely authenticate the uh, the endpoint. Those are the fundamental things that don't occur today in a lot of TCP IP networks. And that's what we're doing, making sure that what you're connecting to and who's connecting is absolutely uh, uh, authenticated. Yeah, and I, I, I failed to introduce, so Kao's our chief marketing officer and a company musician. So thank you, Kao. <laughs> but Mira, I know you have a question, I'm sorry. Unfortunately, we have to keep moving, but Sarah, make sure, Tom, make sure to reach out to Samira in the chat and make sure to address it. Um, we're going to move on now. 
Uh, now we have undefined technologies. Uh, right now, Thomas, we can see the presenter view. If you want to just swap it with the uh, with the other one, yeah, it should be up under display settings. Hopefully, um, then you can uh, you can uh, go right ahead when you're ready. Okay. Um, very good. Let me let me do that. Perfect. We can see it now. You're good. Okay. Can you see the main the main screen? Yep. Okay. Very good. Um. So yes. Uh. Okay. I think we are ready to. Yes. So yes. My name is Tomas Tomas Prevanek. I'm the founder and CEO of Undefined Technologies. We are a Florida-based startup, and one we are developing a selling drone using ion proportional technology in atmospheric conditions. As you have probably seen on the on and heard on the news all the big companies uh such as amazon and, and others are moving into uh delivering cargo using drones in urban areas one of the items that is um a showstopper for a lot of them is is the issue of noise so they it's projected that by 2027 this technology is going to advance quite a bit uh, and it's going to be uh commonly used everywhere However, there are a lot of rules and regulations in the U.S. and around the world that's gonna, that are preventing uh, these technologies from advancing further and faster uh, because of the noise they generate. To give you an idea, a current drone uh, produces between uh, 76 to 95 decibels, and uh, they, are, they are fairly loud. Uh, so it, when, when they're going to urban areas, and if you have multiple drums, drones working at the same time, that can become uh, quite a bit of, a, of an issue. Now, last year, uh, the FAA issued um, what they call a notice of proposal, uh, all proposed rulemaking, and it was the first time that they addressed uh, drones. So this, this uh, proposal had to do with the drone martinet but it applies to all the other drones as well. And it states that uh, for each drone, the, they have to go through a, a certification process, which includes acoustical uh, re uh, requirements. So in other words, a drone cannot be certified unless it passes their acoustical requirements. Now, uh, what our technology does, instead of using fast rotating propellers, we use solid state uh, propulsion which has been used historically for space applications uh, since it's very com complex to generate thrust uh, using air as a medium. And the way this works, you have uh, uh, two electrodes. They are um, charged to uh, very high potential differentials. And then the fluid is ionized. And then those ionized, ionized particles travel very rapidly towards uh, electrodes of op opposite uh, polarity. And therefore, because of that change of momentum, then you generate uh, thrust. So we have a, a competitive advantage uh, during my PhD at the University of Miami. I, I discover a way of increasing the thrust generated in the atmospheric conditions um, by using uh, innovative physics. So uh, with that, um, the startup is a spin up of, of, that, of that research. And uh, we are uh, currently the exclusive licensees of the technology. Using that, uh, we are developing um, a, a, a vertical takeoff and landing drone that is fully electric. Uh, it's called Salad Ventus. And it uses ion propulsion for vertical, uh, for, uh, ver vertical lift. And then we use um, a thrust vectoring device in order to uh, control the pitch, roll, and yaw of the craft. We have um, conducted more than three uh, successful flights, but we have different milestones uh, that we have set forth with our current investors and that gate our success at every point. Uh, and so far we have achieved our longest flight, which happened a couple of weeks ago. That is 4.5 minutes of flight with 75 uh, decibels of noise. Our projection of, for this year, which is, we're almost done, uh, it's to achieve 70 decibels of noise and 15 uh, minutes of flight. Um, so we've gone through uh, the different milestones again, and this is a, a projection of what it's gonna, what it's gonna look like uh, very soon. Uh, these are some images of our uh, um, crafts. 
Uh, the first one was the, the proof of concept that happened in April 30, 2021. Then on June, uh, we had a, a second one for 2.5 minutes. And the last one that we held, uh, that we had on September 13, uh, was indoor for the 4.5 minutes, but we also achieved a second flight that proved our viability to do cargo delivery outdoors. And we, are, we reach up to 100 feet in altitude. Now, as far as how we're gonna, how we're gonna, gonna make money with this. Uh, so the drone market is um, being accelerated towards uh, commercialization. However, most of the funding for this is still uh, held by, by DOD, at least in the US. So we're moving into non-dilutable funding, um, focusing non-dilutable funding, and then we're gonna be moving into commercialization later on. We have uh, talked with most of the uh, um, large drum uh, manufacturers and end users, and they're very, very interested in our technology. Uh, they do wanna see more in order to uh, start signing any type of paperwork at this, at this point. So the goal is to get to 15 minutes of, uh, of flight, which is what they're looking for. Once we reach that gate, then we can start um, um, the, the commercial negotiation of how to move into a partnership with them. 30 second warning. Okay, so we have, uh, you know, we have looked at the market um, as far as what is out there. Uh, there. There are very few competitors that, are, that can achieve the levels of noise that we have. Uh, we have four different uh, revenue streams, and our objective is not to become a drone manufacturer, but to become a drone, uh, a licensor of the technology to drone manufacturers uh, for their military or, or civil use. For our first run, we raised a uh, million dollars in capital, in venture capital funding, and we are projected to receive about 300,000 of non dilutable by this year. And for next year, that's gonna be increased to $5.5 million. Uh, these are some of the non dilutable funding that we are uh, pursuing. And we have a team uh, that, is, uh, that I put together who is uh, very capable and has specific knowledge in the areas of, uh, of the business. And for our board directors, which are also um, two of our investors, uh, we have very well seasoned um, startup in, um, investors, individuals who not only provide funding, but also mentoring and have, um, have good, good strategies of how to move forward. And that's uh, all I have. So I would like to open it up the floor for any questions that you may have. Absolutely, Anne, with the quick draw, uh, go for it, Anne. <laughs> um, actually, there is a, a comment uh, by Brady, uh, Brady Hoth in the in the chat, and um, Brady, maybe you can chime in. But that's a that's a very valid point. I'll just read it out. Uh, the efficiency of aircraft ion propulsion is terrible and will always be bad. If you need to reduce noise, it's a lot better to just use shrouded propellers. Electric drones already have bad range slash endurance now. Could you speak to that? Yes, so the technology is less efficient at this point than propellers, that is that is true. Um, so the market that we're addressing are, are not the long range drones. Our, our market is last mile. And that's one of the reasons why we're doing that. So we. We want to be able to get into areas where um, drones with propellers, even shrouded propellers, uh, cannot get right now. Um, so we, we have other alternatives that are, are being used, such as using uh, winches or other, other uh, type of equipment. And what, it, what happens with that, you end up with a lot of weight and a lot of deficiencies as far as the accuracy of where you want to deliver the package. Um, so it's... It's, diff it's a different approach. So it is a new technology. And if you compare um, ion ionic propulsion to propeller, so we are we are pretty behind because the, um, the propellers are, are about 100 years old, but it's all technology. So I always make the comparison between fire and electricity. So it's time for propulsion to move into something else. Um, so it is, is it, it is less efficient at this point, uh, but our goal is to get it competitive to the two propellers. Okay, so I think if I understood you and thank you for sharing that is that there's sort of this um, 
evolutionary process, right? And this is the sort of 2.0 uh, of propulsion, if you will, and uh, more to come. So I think that's how I would read that. Um, this sounds absolutely fascinating. I can think of actually um, SpaceX as a potential as well uh, with, with what Elon Musk is doing and we're working with him. So if you're interested in uh, you know, partnerships or, and or introductions to uh, you know, potential clients, happy to, to help you with that. Excellent. Yes, I, I would be interested in that. Okay. Thanks, Tomas. All right. Thank you, Anne. We have time for one more question. And, and Josh, if you want to ask your follow up, you can now. Um, I think you should be able to talk. Um, but if not, we'll continue. All right. Perfect. Thank you so much, Thomas. Um, All right. Thank you. Feel free to leave your information in the chat um, so, so people are able to reach out. Um, and last but not least of the session, we have NanoSent presenting. Uh, yeah, hi. Hi. Free to share your screen whenever you're ready. Sure. Hi. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. All ladies and gentlemen, my name is Oded. I'm the chief operation officer of a startup company in, in Israel called NanoSent. Uh, we are located in the northern part of Israel, in the, near the Sea of Galilee. And what we do is we develop a sensor that can make scent readable. Uh, NanoSent is a young startup company, about four, almost five years old, but we already I uh, will uh, please to to receive some some nice awards. We, we we won the Climate Change Innovator Award of the CES 2019 and Kaltner uh, Cool Vendor uh, Award in 2019. Now, as a startup company that uh, have innovation in the field of scent recognition, we ask ourselves what we can do in order to use this technology to rebalance the world. And there are some use cases that we already looked into or currently considering. Uh, for an example, about 30% of fresh goods get thrown away. Uh, and we see if we can use our technology to monitor uh, uh, post-harvest and, 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 and cool uh, storage for fruits and vegetables, meat, dairy products, in order to prolong the shelf life and, and prevent waste. Other use case is almost obvious is uh, monitoring air quality. About 40% of America lives in, in places where unhealthy air is, is, is surrounding. And if we can monitor this air, give some notification and help in, in, in filterization of the air, this could be a good use. Uh, but what we are currently mainly focused on is in renewable energy, green energy, and mainly uh, uh, hydrogen production to omit a greenhouse gases emission. Uh, but in order to understand what we do and what is our sensor and its capabilities, I, uh, I think that the uh, interesting question that we asked ourselves was back in January 2020, uh, about one minute before the entire COVID shutdown uh, hit almost all countries in, 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 in this world. And we saw, we were actually traveling from the CS and we, we heard about borders being closed down in, in China, in Wuhan, in China. And we asked ourselves how we can help with our technology to try and, and stop the, the breakthrough of this pandemic. And we submitted a grant to Horizon, uh, European Horizon 2020, uh, also to the Israeli Innovation uh, Authority. And with this uh, uh, development grants, we were able to develop a chemoresistor. This is basically the core of our technology. It's a chemoresistor. You can see here our sensor. And you can see in the middle, there are actually 12 different sensing elements. So what we do, we are having an array of sensors. And this sensor, this chemical sensor, interact with different gases or different volatile organic compounds. And they change. They change the resistance. Uh, according to different gas. And the fact that we have a, 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 an array of sensors, so it allows a very wide range of gases to detect uh, with very high accuracy, very high sensitivity, and very high uh, specificity to specific uh, gases or to specific 
user needs. So basically, what we, we what we were able to gain uh, in 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 view to other competitors or other technologies that are there in the market is is very high sensitivity. Our sensor can reach uh, sensitivity of up to ten parts per billion. Um, and and with very high production capacity, with high yield and very affordable solution. Now, obviously, there are very there are existing solution, uh, chemo resistor solution, and or state of the art GCMS. But I think that the innovation of, about our technology it's the scalable. It is very affordable in terms of cost, and therefore also very scalable in terms of of implementing or integrating this solution to different use cases. Comparing to the algorithm, to the, to the sensor itself and to the sensing, obviously we have a, a real time dashboards and, 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 and data algorithm that help with analysis the, the, the different cases and show indication to the use cases according to, to each specific need. So when we ask ourselves, how to utilize this technology and what to focus on. Uh, as I was mentioned, we are now very much focusing on, on hydrogen. And we would like to see if we can help with our sensor meet the requirements of uh, hydrogen purity. Hydrogen is considered as a very good and efficient method to replace fossil fuel and other uh, sources of energy. Even natural gas, it is much cleaner. It has zero CO2 emissions uh, during use. Uh, but the problem uh, with, with, with hydrogen, you need it at a very high purity level. And there, there is even ISO standard that defined uh, uh, what is the purity level of the hydrogen. But the, uh, there is no very efficient method nowadays to validate the purity of, of, of the hydrogen and to meet its microcontamination. The current method that are used are basically offline, off-grid, that doesn't give you real-time uh, uh, alerts when a contam contamination occurs. And what you can see here in this slide is basically a prototype, a pilot of a working prototype of nanosent product. We put, this is the housing, housing of the sensor. Uh, and in this picture, you see it, it is connected to a pipeline, to the tubing, to the infrastructure. Uh, so one. basically what we can do, we can get an inline, online monitoring with very low cost and uh, together with a dashboard that can uh, uh, announce for alerts when a specific threshold is met. Uh, currently, the traction, we are doing some pilots with uh, leading companies, uh, NPL, UK, uh, BTG for fermentation, ZSW uh, uh, for electrolyzers, and other companies that are currently evaluating our, our sensor and technology. But basically, Nanosense Core capabilities is the chemical side, meeting a specific chemical to develop a specific sensor for the specific analyte, together with data mining, the machine learning algorithms to increase our specificity. And together, we are able to produce a very low cost, high stable, scalable sensor. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. A <laughs> question. Mark, you're up. Hey, thanks for the presentation. I uh, thank you. Sir. Question for you. You know, the, the base uh, uh, resistance measurement on a chip is is fairly uh, easy to do. Uh, the challenge with this is getting a variety of of chemical sensors that have differential response to the different VOCs. What are you doing to create that array of, of materials that have different response to the to the VOCs? You are one hundred percent correct, and I think that uh, uh, actually we have one granted patent uh, specifically to that. It's called nanoparticles for chemoresistors, together with other uh, seven other pen, uh, pending patents. But the core capabilities is to meet to match uh, the ligands uh, and the solvents and the nanoparticles that together create the sensor. We look at different chemical groups, chemi uh, chemistry chemical groups uh, of the target analyte. And, and, and by doing research, we are able to, 
to, to tie specific chemical compounds and tiles to achieve high sensitivity. Uh, other methods are printing method, printing techniques and, and patterns and RIs to increase the sensitivity, but the core capabilities is uh, to synthesize a, a chemistry that will be very sensitive to the target analyte. This will give you one sensor, but since we have 12, array of 12 sensors, we are able to detect, you know, ammonia, but and toluene, CO2, maybe to have an array of sensors that increase both our specificity and sensitivity. Awesome. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much. And feel free to leave contact information in the chat. Um, sure thing. Absolutely. All right. With that, we, we wrapped up our open topic session. So next up, just to go through it really quickly, we're going to be focusing on additive manufacturing deposits. Uh, leading the way is going to be Monarch, followed by Temper, followed by Elementum 3D. Uh, after that will be Advanced American Technologies and then FISNA. In terms of the panel that we have for the next session, uh, we have a few faces that are going to be staying with us and a few um, joining. Um, I'm, I'm just going to quickly introduce everyone because we, we're running a little bit uh, tight on time. So um, from Dow Ventures, we're going to have Kathleen German. From Splunk, Anne is going to continue to be on. Um, from VU Venture Partners, we're going to have Kip Stringfellow. From Kineo Finance, we have Olivier Demen. Um, from the DIC Corporation, we have Takeo Kad Sorry about that. Um, from the DIU, we have Marshall Witikowski. From Hypertherm Ventures, we have Jan Liu. From Pangea Ventures, we have Matthew Cohen. And from Henkel Tech Ventures, we have Jacob Bryce. Um, so for all the panels who are going to be on this session, please keep your cameras on. Um, it's just, it's easier to talk to a, a real person rather than uh, just a screen. And with that, um, if Monarch would like to start getting their slides ready to, to share, um, the floor is yours. Perfect, do you guys want me to run it on my end? Nope. nope. Sorry, were we on mute? We're, I think we were double muted. Could you guys hear us? We can hear you now. All right. Okay. Our device was muted. Sorry. Starting again. I'm Joe Kafari. I'm the CEO of Monarch. Um, we are a company that exists to create uh, materials, special material science that helps protect war fighters as well as consumers and law enforcement and first responders. Um, we've been in business just over a year now. Um, we created a, a product that sits behind 99% of the kits that are being worn by war fighters and law enforcement people today. Um, it's a very simple technology that solves a very serious problem. Currently, as ceramic, deridium, and other new technologies are used in the actual armor plates, they get thinner and thinner. So just from a physics perspective, we're seeing more and more transfer of energy into the bodies of the individuals wearing them. So what we've done is create a pad that disperses that energy as any kind of blunt trauma it can be ballistic, can be just a frozen water bottle, could be a baseball bat, could be any kind of trauma. We see in law enforcement, vehicular collisions causing sternal impacts. We're seeing in our military segment, um, ballistic rounds, and as well as seeing falls, uh, fast roping down from a helicopter, slipping on a rock, hitting their chest as they land on the ground. So we focused on creating a solution that is um, very efficable, but yet blue collar technology. So we're stopping 94% of the energy that's coming through from a nine millimeter all the way down to 18% of a shotgun. What do these numbers mean? Not only is it a tremendous amount of energy that's being dispersed in a terrible situation, but it's the difference in having to take a knee in that specific opportunity. So what have we done to date? Uh, we've been in business, as I mentioned, just a little over a year. 
We closed the seed round last year, and now we're in the midst of our Series A. Um, we've been in revenue since the beginning of this year. We're up to eight full-time employees with an, uh, two more that just signed on today. So we'll be up to 14 by the end of the year. We have distribu distribution agreements across the board in federal law enforcement, all the way through military with companies like Amchar, Granger is our largest, Dana Safety Supply, Unifier, um, as well as distribution throughout the United Kingdom and uh, Western Europe with EPL. Um, we've also had these scientifically vetted, not just by um, traditional agencies, but by medical professional, by physicists, so that it's not just us telling you we have a great product. We've also been vetted out by third parties and validated. So it's a pretty significant market, uh, market just for our trauma pads across the world today. As we look at it, we manufacture these right here. It's all domestic. We are a berry compliant pro um, product. Um, our manufacturing is done in a veteran owned small business. Um, so the people that actually make these have worn these, um, which is fairly unique in the manufacturing space. We have a very close relationship with our manufacturer. Our model is very simple. They're made right here in New York State, um, produced and shipped out through our distribution channels and or direct to our government customers. Lots of partners. Um, we work very closely across the spectrum of both government as well as law enforcement, as well as kind of the distribution sector. If anyone understands law enforcement here in the US, it's very fractionalized. So you have multiple partners across the country that cover certain jurisdictions. And in the military, we work very closely across all the branches. Um, the kits are worn universally. So whether you're protecting an airman or you're protecting um, an infantry soldier, most of them have similar kits, which we fit in very easily. So we stack up well against our competitors and we run these specifically through the test gauntlet against them. Um, our competitors have traditionally used poron foams and other foam based uh, products. Um, some are even more expensive than what we charge. We've created a very simple, elegant technology that does its job really well and it's priced very aggressively so that we're protecting people not worrying about the economics on a 360 degree basis. We wanted a product that a law enforcement official could buy instead of buying a uh, set of golf balls. So we also go into multiple different categories with the exact same product. Our trauma pads were our first product that we went out with. Now we're going into ruck and hiking because it's about energy disbursement with our material science. It's about taking any kind of load carrying system and making it feel lighter. In our insoles, it makes your feet feel better because we have a very fast return to form, so it's not squishy. In our protective sporting goods, we started off in the highest and most difficult product segment, and that's serving our warfighters. And now we're going into sporting goods where we can make little Johnny's fastball that hits a catcher's mask not feel so bad. So we're targeting about $106 million in revenue over the next few years. Um, with a very healthy EBITDA line as well. We built a very experienced management team. Most recently additions, um, West Point grad Matt King, who's our new Senior VP of Technology Development, um, Terry Lucero, who's our Head of Sales, all have you know, multiple decades of experience, both in the government military sectors, as well as in public safety. Our CMO just came over from building very large brands for other companies that are very well recognized and a very deep bench of our four founders um, who have been here since day one. Most importantly, our board of advisors, the folks that help us open doors so that we can actually build successful channels, um, very deep military bench, um, special forces, individuals, Homeland Security individuals. And most recently, we just brought on the former GM of Nike, um, also, he was the former GM of the Kevlar Business Unit for DuPont and also president of Advanced Fibers um, for a company, very well-known company. Our Series A fundraise, we're doing a $7 million preferred equity round. We've already got over $3 million committed against that. Um, we also have non-dilutive funding through the AFWorks program, where we have an MOU for our Generation 2 um, hybrid bonded product, which takes the existing product and directly bonds it to um, whether it's a ceramic or a deridium or other material. So it creates a single skew for the military sector. Um, we solve a very 
serious problem with very elegant but simple technology. We solve the physical and psychological consequences that individuals and organizations have after the event occurs. Um, we create fewer injuries. We get people back in the fight or back on the job. The same exact technology goes out and does this, a fantastic job going into sporting goods now as well. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, guys. It looks like we have the first question from Olivia. Just to remember, remind all the panelists here, if you want to ask a question, feel free to just raise your hand virtually on Zoom, and we will do. We will go in the order of raise. Perfect. There you go. Go ahead, Olivia. Uh, hi, guys. Thank you very, very much for the presentation. Uh, it was great. This one question, I'm not obviously a military slash defense specialist, but it looks like you, you have a lot of different applications on vertical or industry to look at right and also it looks like from your presentation um those those industry are looking at like for defense can be quite fragmented so my question is how is your go market strategy who would you tackle basically those next steps because you generate revenue at the moment you want to scale you want to grow um wh what would you do how would you you tackle that with the seven million you are raising now so what we've done is we've built a very simple base product that allows us to create derivative products out of, so using the exact same materials. So we take that base layer product that's standalone, and now we integrate it directly into a bonded product. The bonded product then becomes what we call a torso suit, where we do even more integration into the um, both the warfighter and the professional athletes here. Um, so as much as it, there's an amazing amount of applications for our technology, we're staying focused on a bifurcated, bifurcated strategy of military with very similar products and using very similar derivative products into sporting goods for now. After that, as we get larger a year from now when we're doing a Series B, then we'll go more aggressively into other applications um, in different sports. And how, how we scale from that is, you know, this is really a, a licensing model in a yep. big way, right? So we're not going to manufacture, you know, new... Uh, helmets or new uh, shin guards or new armor. Uh, it's a licensing or joint venture agreement using our patented uh, energy dispersal system. Our goal is to be the Gore-Tex of the yeah. military and sporting goods space with dark matter. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Kathleen, you're up. Hi hey guys, thanks for the presentation. So I'm a material person. Um, can you give me any idea of what this thing actually is? Because I can't, you sure. know, I, yeah, whatever you can share. Yeah. Be great. Thanks. We'll, we'll give you an, an overarching, you know, kind of a 30,000 foot level of the, of the material science. So layered energy dispersal system uses uh, a combination of either a semi-rigid or a rigid substrate, as well as um, a few uh layers uh in addition to that um not not simple uh foams or anything like that but a few uh pretty significant uh pieces of material science and adhesives that all layer together basically it creates an energy baffling system so we're agnostic to what substrates we use inside of our patent structure but we do have some uh best case optimal ones that we like to use um without you know kind of diving into the exact chemical details. But again, design patent, not a not a chemical patent. And we've designed this in a way to protect ourselves um, and kind of also moat ourselves against any kind of product obsolescence. And as new, pro new properties of new substrates come out, we're able to swap them in and make our product better. We have a very um, high ability to adjust our durometers and our thicknesses as well. So as we're going into sappy sizing, for instance, we can adjust those durometers and thicknesses to create something that, that's super lightweight. If somebody, say a military group, wants a very super lightweight, not worried so much about fitment or that construct, we can do that. If someone wants something that's more uh, protective in nature, so a little bit thicker, we can do that as well. So we can adjust our uh, product to the customer's needs. Yeah, we have a very close relationship with one of our substrate providers that... Um that allows us to adjust all that uh, at will. So a variety of polymers might be possible. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Well said. I, I thought you'd like that. And is the patent published at this point? 
Uh, it's pending. Yeah, Still pending. but it's out there. Okay, okay great. Thank you. Yep. And there are multiple patents. Um, as you'll when you do a little search, you'll see. Okay, very good. Thanks. Thank you. Perfect. Last question. You're up. All right. Hi, guys. Thanks uh, for the overview. I did two questions. One was about the materials, which was just covered. So, so thanks. The other one was about um, how does the, the, the company differentiate with other existing ones? Like, is, is the main benefit um, that they're more durable and they spread energy better, or uh, the pricing will be better, or a combination of various things? What's like the main uh, differentiator you're going for? So, this is where we like to do show and tell. In Joe's hands, you'll see the product that we produce. Um, super thin, super lightweight, um, very cost effective, and extremely focused on energy dispersal. In Connor's hands, you'll see what our competition sells, which is also the same stuff that the yoga studio below our office uses in their classes that start at four o'clock this afternoon. Ironic, we're protecting warfighters. They keep your knees safe in case of a downward dog pose. Um, theirs are more expensive. So what we compete against are foams, uh, various foams. Um, our new laptops actually came in better foam than the existing pads that are on the market come in. And the pour on comes in an interesting cut. Basically what happens is companies who create trauma inserts, they basically test their test the armor, right? See, put it against a clay block, see what the deformation is. Then they slap a piece of pour on wrapped in nylon behind it and say, well, we put some mass in there. So now the deformation into the clay is less. So we're doing something. Um, in reality, that's just the, the matter of physics and putting mass in space. What we do is actually create an increase, you know, over a very short time dilation, use physics to dissipate that energy and off gas it before it actually gets to the body. So this, from a safety standpoint, is really not doing much. It's just, um, basically addressing NIJ standards from a back face deformation standpoint, but not actually addressing behind armor blunt trauma. So NIJ standard 0101.6 allows you uh, an amount of back face deformation as Connor was articulating. We went beyond that. We said, okay, that clay block, we have yet to find a human that replicates a clay block and vice versa. So we actually created a, a further test that because of our medical backgrounds, we created a slurry that actually mimicked interstitial fluid within the body. And then we created a rocker system. So if you've ever watched one of these tests occur, the body does not stay rigid when struck with any kind of blunt force. It gives and it comes back. So we mimic that in our testing with neurosurgeons and other physiologists so that it wasn't just about testing to a standard because that's what the government says you need to do. It's about actually creating a product that is efficable for those that are wearing it. Awesome, thanks. Thanks for the overview. I think we're out of time, but yeah, th thank you very much. Thank you. And Stephen, to answer your question in the chat, uh, we basically say these have a two-year life, uh, but we, uh, we say that they should be replaced after armor is struck in front of it, or you get in a vehicular accident with your armor and this behind it, uh, replace it upon upon impact. But if the question was how many could it, theoretically, we've done 176 rounds against it without any kind of deformation. Yeah. So the barrel melted off the gun at that point. Nice. All right, that's all the time we have. Thank you so much. Um, make sure to leave some level yeah. of contact information in the chat. Uh, and yeah, absolutely. Feel free to, to, to yeah, share away. Next up, we have Bill Dijkstra presenting for Temper 8. Bill, uh, yeah, perfect. You got him up. Hello. <clears throat> Hello. Uh, my name is Bill Dijkstra, and I'm here to talk about the next big thing in the world of processing composite materials. We are a company that develops solutions by utilizing magnetic fields to consolidate composite parts. Although we have nine different applications of this technology, time only permits us to talk about one, which is to take the currently developed smart susceptor matched metal tooling concept and apply automotive know-how to it. 
We are proposing that you take our smart receptor processing knowledge and combine it with 3D printed tooling inserts to be able to go from design to 100 parts produced in 10 days. Why is this important? Current composite manufacturing fabrication methods are basically the same as when the processes were originally developed in the 1970s. But with automation added and processing streamlined, current state of the art is a processing time of three to five hours for aerospace grade components. To back up a little bit, we already developed the technology to be able to rapidly produce parts with a three and a half minute cycle time under a DOE program led by the Boeing company. This process was not marketable due to the high tooling insert material cost, tool structure, and low volumes of aerospace components. Our game-changing tool solution is simple. 3D print only the portions of the tool that interact with the part and the rest of the tool becomes reusable for hundreds of different parts. Just print a new insert, which saves over 80% of the tooling cost per part. So to recap, the proposal is to go from design to finish tool in eight days and be able to produce 50 parts per day afterwards. The advantage being that the parts will have the carbon fibers oriented in the correct directions and the orientation of the fibers that can't be achieved using current 3D printing machines. Slides six and seven are a little bit on how the smart susceptor technology works over traditional heating systems. Here we can see the difference. In most resistance or fluid heating applications, you supply power and you have to wait till the temperature levels. With our smart susceptor heating system, the induction heating couples directly into the tool surface and can only heat the material to its Curie temperature. The Curie temperature is the material of the material is selected by choosing the chemical composition. So to have a Curie temperature or an automatic switch of sorts that automatically turns off the heating when the temperature has been achieved, this means you can heat very accurately, very fast. So to set the temperature, self-adjust, not because of a knob, but because of the chemical composition of the tooling forming shell material. The aerospace market, oops, the aerospace market is exploding with new aircraft and methods of fabricating parts in an auto autoclave restriction environment. The applications are endless. We have the technology to fabricate these parts at a fraction of the processing costs of current technology. Our customers are varied. The process is well protected with over a hundred patents in this area by both Boeing and Temper. And we and Temper has license to use all of them. The key team, you will pick up on who the true boss is in the lower right hand corner. The big ask. Be our MOU signatory. We currently have this proposal as an AppWorks proposal, and we are looking for an MOU signatory. VCs and customers, let's talk on how we can develop a roadmap forward and letters of support from interested parties. Questions? Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bill. It look, okay, it looks like uh, we have a hand raised from Cam. 
Go ahead. The floor is yours. Uh, hi. Uh, this is Federico. Uh, thank you for the, uh, the presentation. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, the, uh, can I ask the uh, what the, is the uh, business model, like selling the, uh, the equipment or the selling the products? We are selling the tooling. Tooling, okay. Okay, so we can do in this in this configuration. Remember, there's nine different food groups, right? In this configuration, it is a matched metal tool that can heat thermal plastics or thermal sets from room temperature to process temperature and back down again in less than three and a half minutes. And three and a half minutes is just the amount of time it took us when we made our first part. We could actually go faster, but Boeing said, no, that's fast enough. Okay, so uh, um, yeah, as a chemical company, um, we uh, deploy your technology, we need to change our process. Uh, what the drive, what what the like, made the, the company drive uh, incorporate your uh, products? Oh, no, sorry about that. Your tool. What was the driver for developing yeah, your yeah. tool? Uh, the driver, the customer, uh, choose your tool. Uh, it is volume in aerospace. You it, using an autoclave to make parts is a huge bottleneck. We have a we have this same technology in a different configuration that is currently saving Boeing six hundred thousand dollars a year, and eliminated the use of an autoclave uh, in making the rear elevators for the seven eight seven. So instead of each plane set going through the autoclave, and this is not a, a small thing, right? It is. Uh, instead of them using it six trips through the auto clave to make one plane set now they only have to do two of the left and right so it is speed and production before what drove the what's driving this is we have to the 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 chemical composition of the tooling sets the curie temperature but in order to get that chemical composition you have to make a make a uh, an ingot of material and then machine away everything that you don't want that is horrendously expensive two hundred thousand dollars per tool now with 3d printing and working with Sayaki using electron beams in chicago we can do that for twenty thousand dollars per set so just the material cost before it's one tenth as much plus machining and so on and so forth. So our proposal is to go from design to a hundred parts or design to uh, to making a tool that can make parts in eight days. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Matt, you're up. Yeah, thanks. Uh, interesting technology for sure. I can certainly see how leveraging metal 3D printing could make this sort of viable, whereas in the past, it was tough. My question is more around the parts that are being created. So do any changes need to be made to either the, you know, the resins or, or the fibers or, or just the you know polymer materials that go in or, or can they just be used the exact same way, the same materials that would otherwise be used in traditional composite manufacturing processes that don't utilize your, you know, induction heating approach? That's the beauty of it. We can make the, we can change the chemical composition of the tool to anything, to any temperature range that you're looking for. So instead of, uh, so we can use the exact same materials in the exact same fiber arrangements in the exact same methods that's currently being done, but we've cut the time to make a part by an order of magnitude. Got it. Thanks. That should probably help a little bit in getting parts specced in. If there don't, doesn't need to be significant materials changes, I would think, in the aerospace industry. None. And we can go to 900 degrees F, which is the new, which is the new standard. Current technology, where you heat the material up and then shuttle it into the tool, uh, at 
950, the material lights on fire using RF heaters, whereas what, because we heat in a dye that's in a closed environment, we can heat it up to that temperature easy. Nice. Awesome. Thank you so much, Bill. Uh, the time's up, but make sure to leave your contact information in the, in the chat. Uh, that was fantastic. Next up on the agenda, we have Elementum 3D presenting for Elementum 3D is the CEO, Jacob. Uh, Jacob, you're up when, you, uh, when you're ready. Yeah, thanks, Asher. Uh, let me share my screen here. All right, is that working? Okay, uh, yeah, I appreciate it. So I'm uh, Dr. Jacob Dechterlein. Um, my background is in material science and metallurgy from the Colorado School of Mines. Um, and my company, Elementum 3D, develops new alloys and new materials for metal 3D printing. So I think a good segue from the last conversation uh, to developing new alloys and, and doing things that aren't just the standard products that you can find elsewhere. So we, we typically stray away from the typical alloys that are printable and go towards things that people say are not possible. Uh, so our products are now in rocket engines, um, all sorts of components for the DOD and DOE um, and F1 racing. I wanna first start and talk a little bit about the business cases because we are a material supplier. So we supply the metal powders. We'll have an atomizer for our aluminums and then we have partnerships for other alloys like nickel super alloys and steels. Um, but I, I really want to focus in on the business cases. Why use 3D printing? What's the point? Why? And, and it's helpful that we had an example just before this. Um, but the, the ones that we typically see start with light weighting and removing bulk. And that's not typically a good enough business case for people to want to jump into a new manufacturing method like metal 3D printing and laser powder bed. Um, oftentimes, it, it takes that in combination with one of these other three business cases. Um, like mentioned previously, printing designs that aren't otherwise possible, like cooling channels that hug contours, um, induction heating, those sorts of things, manifolds, antennas that can be shapes that otherwise you could not do, uh, and then like things like baffles and, and changing fluid pathways where it can be larger or smaller as, as fluid is flowing through a, uh, say a heat exchanger is really, really, that's, that's the sort of things that just aren't possible with traditional manufacturing methods. Um, next is combining parts. So the example we have on the bottom right here is a component designed by Moog. It takes an actuator that used to be 20 parts in the size of like a, a shoe box. Um, and now this pneumatic actuator is a single component so it takes away the logistics of, of, you know, trying to combine all these parts and do the inspections on the different combinations um, and, and turns it into a single, much smaller, much lighter weight component. Uh, and now there's, there's designs and discussions about reducing part count um, on an engine from 900 parts down to 20. Imagine the guy on the tarmac who has to repair one of these engines, keeping track of 20 different components and how to um, you know, do inspections and repairs on 20 components is way different than the person who needs to keep track of 900 different components, much less the number of different engines that they're looking at. Uh, and then the coming soon, as I say, in, in uh, additive manufacturing is the logistical improvements. And that's where we're really seeing movement in like oil and gas, mining, um, and some other applications to go with the aerospace and space industries um, is, is really being able to email a component across an ocean rather than shipping it across the ocean. If you can email it to a local manufacturer, um, there's a lot of advantage to then not having to wait for that component to be shipped or loaded. Um, and there's a lot of advantages coming along those lines that we're seeing. So um, we're seeing some big movement there, but that is still coming. I, I, I talk about you know the day where you can reduce a 100,000 square foot facility down to a 10,000 square foot facility with a number of printers in them so that you don't have to have components sitting on the shelf. So what makes Elementum different? Why, why you know, go through that whole spiel? Um, we open up new alloy possibilities with our reactive additive manufacturing techniques. Uh, so that's a patented process where we, we essentially have solved the welding issue for high strength aluminums um, and high temperature nickel super, super alloys. So we've taken something where you get these big columnar grains that grow as you're printing or welding something 
And we break those, that grain structure up by using our reactive additive manufacturing process, where essentially we, we go through a chemical reaction during the printing process and in the liquid state. Now, what this means is as we add our RAM materials to this, we see a reduction in the grain size. So you can clearly see you know, cracks forming in between the grains here. As we add more RAM content, you see the grain size decrease and then also the orientation of those grains decrease. So that means that you get very similar properties in the vertical and the horizontal, and you get higher strengths and other benefits that come along with finer grain size. Um, from there, we then present, well, now we can print these high strength aluminums that are otherwise unprintable. Um, things like 6061 aluminum, which is the most common aluminum used in aerospace and in the rest of industry today, um, we can print that now, whereas otherwise you form cracks and have other issues. It may look nice, but it doesn't actually perform well. We now can match the performance in fatigue, in corrosion resistance, in strength and ductility of 6061, traditionally wrought CNC machine 6061 with a 3D printed product. Um, we provide more than just the material. We also provide the um, printing parameters. So we have printers in house to help print the first couple prototype components and to design our settings on a number of different printers from EOS, SLM, um, 3D systems. We have settings in development and work with all three of them and, and printers in house um, so that we can provide a lot of data that's just not possible to provide otherwise. We have flight components now. Um, we work with all sorts of companies, companies that talk about us um, we have flight, we have parts that are orbiting right now, and we, we also have parts that are actually in the engines of F1 racing vehicles today, um, racing and winning races. And, and so uh, it, it's already here, it's just not a lot of people know about it. Um, we have a pretty strong team. Uh, there's, there's a number of different technical people and then also business oriented people on our team uh, with a lot of experience, um, you know, coming from a relatively young guy like myself. Uh, it's helpful to have a lot of experience on our team and then also on our board as well. Uh, just to touch base on a couple of our customers, uh, customers like Northrop Grumman, we did development work with Northrop. Uh, and now they go to trade shows and talk about our materials versus their experience with other materials um, in the industry and, and what's available. And, and certainly we see a lot of benefits to um, what we have over, say, a cast alloy, which is really the only other possibilities that are out there that are viable. So what are we, warning. What's that? 30 second warning. Okay. Um, what are we looking for? Uh, we're looking for um, to build partnerships and projects that help leverage additive manufacturing and our materials in particular. Um, we certainly have a lot of knowledge and experience in printing. We've started in 2014. So that makes us kind of elder statesmen uh, in the additive industry. Um, but uh, there's a lot that we are working on and lots that we're diving into as far as developing new proposals. We work well as a sub um, on larger proposals as the materials science um, and printing side of things. Um, and we also work well in, in prime um, situations as well where we can really go after applications. But ultimately we wanna supply the advanced metal powders for your needs. Thank you. Perfect, thank you so much. All right. And then Ann, go ahead, Kip. All right. Uh, thanks, Jacob, for the, the presentation. Um, I think you might have just touched on this in like the last sentence you said, but I was, I was curious what the main uh, business model um, is for the, the company. It's to, 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 to sell the, the powders to companies yep. that then have their own equipment and will use them, or you actually Correct. do custom jobs. Or what, what's the primary business model that you, you plan to do? Sell the metal powder. So we want to sell the consumable, the ink that goes into the metal laser powder bed printers. Um, while we do have services like metallurgist um, uh, consulting work that we do as well, um, our primary business is selling the metal powder. Okay. And then they, it's, uh, do they need specialized uh, new kinds of printers too, or they can be with existing ones. It's just what's different is the actual powders that allows different kinds of use cases. Exactly. That's the crucial part for us is, is making sure that you can use um, an off the shelf system. Okay. Okay. Clear. Thanks. All right. Go ahead, Ann. Hi. Thank you so much. Yeah. Great job there. And uh, congratulations on Elementum. Um, uh, one question you mentioned uh, there's, you're moving into a, I think it was a 43,000 uh, square foot facility. Could you tell us where that is? 
uh, yeah. assuming somewhere in the U.S.? Yep, just north of Denver um, is our proposed site. We're still working on na nailing down exactly where, but we believe Thornton, which is about 20 minutes to a half an hour north of Denver in Colorado. Okay, thank you. And then secondly, are you familiar with the IIGA uh, 2022? It's the uh, Innovate Infrastructure Innovation and Jobs Act. Uh, a little bit, but not specifically how it could uh, interact with what we do. Yeah, uh, I think I can intro you to 300 mayors. Uh, that would take uh, significant interest in this. Uh, feel free to reach out to Asher to connect with me. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, perfect. We have time for one more just, question. Uh, yeah, uh, for what it, other yeah. good question if no one, no one else uh, uh, will take that. Um, what, what the new facility, uh, what would that be used for? Uh, so we're installing a, an aluminum atomizer at that facility so that we can produce our own metal powders on site rather than purchasing the metal powders and then treating those metal powders with our uh, materials. Uh, so we'll be able to make our own and that helps us with the development cycle and with having a second source of aluminum metal powder in the United States. Uh, U.S. supply for a lot of our DOD contracts is really important. And so we're trying to nail down that there's multiple supply sources within the U.S., um, which makes us the second in the U.S. with any volume for metal alloy powders. Got it. I see. So it just it'd be to yeah, supply all the, the, the raw inputs for, for what you need. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much, Jacob. Feel free to leave contact information. I know that uh, Steve is also here. So also. Um, and. That was that was a great presentation. Next up, we have Advanced American Technologies. The floor Thank is you yours when you guys are ready. Can you can you hear me? Okay, Asher. I can hear you loud and clear. Roger that. Uh, this is Rob Grigsby, President of Advanced American Technologies. Asher, thank you very much to you and the Deep Tech team for putting this on. Really appreciate it. Uh, Advanced American Technologies is a uh, company located yeah. in. Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, we are a proprietary binder system. Uh, we produce right now three different systems, aluminum, ceramic, and silica. Rob, uh, we are- Rob. Yes. We can't see the presentation right now. Okay, should be able to. Should share, why didn't I share? There it is. Okay, now we can see it. Thanks, sorry. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, so we're located in Huntsville, Alabama uh, and also in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Uh, we have an 8,000 square foot facility here in Huntsville, which is where I'm located. We do research and development uh, located here. Uh, team that I've got uh, surrounding me is uh, varied, both uh, in skill sets, but also experience. Uh, we have uh, CPA to construction to business owners, et cetera, uh, a predominantly military background, uh, which is really what one of the folks of the company was to get uh, veterans into the company. Uh, our partners are varied as well. Uh, we have anywhere from the nuclear side of the house, we have Japan Homeland Security, uh, EAI, uh, and uh, MVP, for example, all, all partners that we're working with very closely to develop our product line. Uh, and also uh, provide supply chain uh, capability for us as well. So what is Atlas? Atlas is a proprietary binder. Uh, we, uh, if you look at the, the right, uh, we're looking at various solids that we combine with that. And in, in the case of uh, the three materials that we have right now, uh, along with our curing agents, uh, and then uh, combine that with an aggregate that we are uh, really looking to I, I identify and define what the mechanical properties are that we're looking for. I'll go through those here in a little bit, uh, but it has a, a fantastic uh, opportunity where it acts very similar or acts uh, in property wise. You get the benefits of, in some cases, of, of true metallic. Uh, and then the other case, you get the benefits of a plasticity uh, that occurs with that. And so uh, as, uh, I think it was Monarch was talking about their ballistic side of the house. We've done a lot of work on the ballistic side for impact resistance and things like that as well. Uh, we've also done thermal and I'll show you a, a video here in a little bit. Uh, we do 
treat our product as a trade secret. Uh, we have had it uh, attempted to be reverse engineered. It's impossible to do so uh, right now. Uh, so we do that uh, specifically to uh, not have to publish uh, the actual formulation itself. Some of the benefits that we have here, uh, non-permeable, it is a castable product. So when we, uh, what you saw in the pictures there at the facility are uh, large mixers. Uh, it's basically a, a resin system that is combined. Uh, we bring that and cast that into molds that we either manufacture on site, we have CNC machined, uh, or we additively manufacture those molds. So it's very easy for us to produce products very quickly. Uh, we can take a design that comes in the door and have a prototype back out to a customer within uh, six days or seven days, uh, depending on the complexity of the mold. Uh, but it's very easy to do that. Uh, we can modify the formulation uh, very easily, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit, but you can see some of the, some of the benefits that you get from this, and it is a castable product, but uh, and it is, does have these attributes of both metallic and uh, plastic, uh, you get some really unique features from that. This is a test uh, that we just did for NASA. Uh, on the left and right is the actual testing that NASA did in the center is our material being tested all the way up to 3,700 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, these are for landing pads, uh, moon-based landing pads, uh, but also could have applicability here on, uh, on Earth with uh, landing for vertical takeoff landing aircraft. Logistically, uh, it's very unique from this standpoint. It is a lightweight material. We are about 38% lighter than aluminum, 78% lighter than steel. Uh, very quick to manufacture. Uh, we have a multitude of aggregates that we can select. Those can be in situ. So uh, if you Imagine what the, on the lunar side of the house, what NASA is looking at is the ability to take a small amount of the binder to the moon, combine it with moon dust, that actual flame test that you saw being on the video there is actually moon dust that was combined uh, to look at taking the regolith and with our binder and using that as the landing pad itself. And then you can take it and combine it with much more plentiful materials such as silica. Uh, so if you look at the ability to take this into the field uh, and manufacture housing, pipes, uh, et cetera, uh, it'd be very easy to do. Your logistical footprint comes down significantly. Again, on that side of the house, carbon footprint, we're much easier uh, uh, to manufacture and therefore much uh, lower carbon footprint. There's no mining required. Uh, as we can take these very abundant raw materials and combine it with it, we are recyclable. And we can also include captured carbon in the product itself. We are an AI driven uh, product. Uh, you can see here, we've spent an immense amount of time and money uh, focusing on testing. Uh, you see Oak Ridge National Labs, which is why we have the, our facility up there. Uh, we're tied in very closely with DOE. Uh, we have projects going right now with Pacific Northwest National Lab, Los Alamos National Labs, Indian National Lab, Oak Ridge National Lab. Uh, 30-second warning. Roger that. Uh, so we taste, basically take the data that we've got there that we've collected, combine it, put it back into the system and are able to modify the formulation basically to meet the customer's needs. So if the customer comes in and says, I'd like to have this kind of performance on the thermal side of the house, radiation shielding of this capability, mechanical properties of this, and I can also put in costs in there. Now the AI can actually drive that formulation, send it right to the mixing uh, unit and then combine uh, the products and get within an hour to two hours, have your actual product in hand. So applications, we can do spray, we can do casting, we can do extrusion and the additive side of the house. One of the things that's unique about this is that we can do planar deposits uh, which will significantly and exponentially increase the speed with which you can actually manufacture components. Markets, uh, products that we are generating revenue from right now with Arca Rhythm, uh, Missile Defense Agency, Lockheed Martin, Y-12, which is a very large project, uh, which is a, a multi-billion dollar cleanup of the Y-12 facility, and then American Wind on the renewable side of the house as well. Future business. Uh, you can see we have a lot that we are working on 
on this side of the house, whether it be tooling, which is what we actually started out from, radiation shielding, NASA, windows uh, for replacing aluminum, uh, wheels for carbon fiber, et cetera. Production and distribution. Again, I mentioned uh, there's an example of one of our mixers. Uh, these can, can be bought all the way up to 10,000 gallons if that requirement is there. Uh, we have multiple sources for mixing if we need it for scalability. Uh, we have commitments from all of our suppliers up to a million pounds a month within 10 months. So very easy to do. Uh, we're looking for strategic partners, uh, any kind of teaming opportunities for SIVRs, STTRs, and then government applications as well, specifically with uh, the airfields, et cetera, uh, being the, the ability to do the vertical takeoff landing or also uh, airfield repair. Thank you very much. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much, Rob. All right, with that, we'll open up the floor for questions. Sure, go ahead, Pico. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, it's really interesting about the jobs. Uh, yeah, I'm just uh, wondering, the, uh, like you said, the, uh, it's a low, low carbon uh, material. Um, there's a like, recently huge demand about the low carbon products. Uh, can, yes. you, uh, can you explain a little bit about like, why it's low carbon like, mechanisms? Could yeah, so, so part of it is the process by which, uh, if you compare it to a foundry operation of actually making a, a metallic uh, solution set, uh, the, the actual energy consumption that's required to actually manufacture something like this is significantly lower just because of the process you're going through. You're not having to you know, stoke a furnace, et cetera. Uh, and so with the ability to actually modify the formulation with the different additives that we can put in it, we can now replicate the and emulate the mechanical requirements of whatever it is you're looking for uh, and then keep that cost down okay. um, in, the, in the carbon footprint. Okay, and uh, uh, so far, it looks like the other uh, materials is used for the like aerospace or like military uh, use. Yes, yes we uh, already have. Uh, we've already been qualified by the FAA for through DO 160 uh, for 737s and uh, Gulfstream aircraft, both internally and externally to the aircraft, passed all 14 requirements. Uh, so uh, we do have that STC in place already, so we can apply that to any other aerospace uh, product lines. Okay. So in, in case of the, uh, like, a, a, apply to the uh, commercial use, uh, are there any, like, limit? In, any what? Uh, any limitation uh, or some? Like the, you need to protect the uh, your material for the airspace or military use. Well, is it easy to applicate to the uh, commercial use? Very easy to apply to the commercial side of the house. Um, so I'll give you an example of the the spray application is a perfect example of taking that. Um, the project uh, that we developed that for was the the Y12 mercury remediation, which is basically uh, entombing mercury to to make sure it doesn't, doesn't leach into the environment. Um, that can be applied to uh, the construction industry extremely easily. Uh, to, and because our R value is so good, uh, for example, our ceramic R value at, two, at a eighth of an inch uh, is uh, 2.5. And so uh, significantly improved uh, thermal shielding properties so you could apply it from that standpoint you could cast it uh into uh you know uh, roofing sections for example with the actual shape of the shingle put into it uh, and you would have a lifetime roof uh, we have had the material tested by doe uh, for a ten thousand year lifespan for nuclear storage containers thank you very much perfect next up we have Anne, but we have to make it a little quick Yep, real quick. Um, are, are you uh, self-funded uh, till now? And also, uh, uh, what's the capital uh, uh, commitment thus far uh, that's uh, been infused into the company? Thank so you. We've raised about $3 million. It's all private um, thus far. And then uh, we are looking for investors to you know, scale the company uh, to get it to where we can actually you know, uh, take it to the next level very quickly. Yeah, we are looking at licensing the material out. So uh, that's the goal of the company is to 
basically manufacture the raw materials and then provide them to the customer. Very using very similar to a Coca-Cola model, uh, we would provide the mixing capability. We would provide the you know the uh, spray equipment, et cetera, uh, uh, as part of that package. Very similar to a Coke dispenser at a at a, any other restaurant, and then provide the resins in that case. Uh, the raw materials that they would need for actually manufacturing this. All right, thank you. Perfect, perfect. Thank you so much, Rob. I see that you already have put your info in the chat, so that's perfect. Um, next and last up for this session is FISNA. Um, go ahead, Andy or, or Kevin, uh, whoever, whoever, I think it's Andy, right? Andy's presenting today? No, it would be me, Ralph. Oh, okay, perfect. Well, go ahead, the floor is yours. Thank you. Let me share my screen. <laughs> Hopefully you can see my screen okay. I can see it, it's perfect. Perfect, so Ralph Mera, I'm uh, head of sales engineering at FISNA and um, our business is all about unlocking the full potential of 3D data. So let me explain a little bit about that based on our history. Our CEO is a patents lawyer and all he wanted to do back in 2016 was determine if two vases were actually uh, identical or not, if there was some kind of um, intellectual property infringement that took place. So after looking around in the industry and not finding what he needed, he invented the algorithms and patented the algorithms that transform a physical object into or extract the physical DNA of an object. So it's a bunch of numbers that describe that object so well that allows you even to a uh, uh, compare a portion of that object to its origin and based on its DNA signature, be able to say this is identical or this is very similar. What this means is that uh, back in 2018, when our technology was working already pretty well, uh, Sequoia, Google Ventures took a look at what the market was doing in terms of um, the explosion of 3D data, the digital transformations, uh, the presence of um, a lot of additive manufacturing initiatives, digital twins, and they invested about $86 million. And so we're a series B startup. We're about 50, 50 people, mostly engineers. Um, in 2020, we launched things.com. That's our public website with over 14 million objects um, indexed, 3D objects used a lot by additive manufacturing. And in 2022, we started signing up uh, customers. So we have customers across the industry and we're slowly kind of growing our company. The best way to understand what we do is actually to see a demo. So I'm going to tempt the demo gods here a little bit. And I'll start over here. If I provide FISNA a picture of an object that I'm looking for, if that object exists in the database, FISNA will find it in the database for me. Once I have it as a 3D object using just a browser, I can manipulate it. So there's no costly license for a CAD system. And yet anybody can manipulate the object see that this, for example, this bolt is not available in stock and then run a query just based on geometry. It found that for that bolt, there are several other potential matches, one of which is actually uh, a 100% physical match. So if I reorganize the labels here a little bit, you can see you can have information about stock, about material, cost, source, and so on. So this allows you not to just to search based on geometry, but also to search based on uh, metadata as well. And then you can do searches like this. Where does the bolt actually go? Where does it fit? And that gives you just a general idea of what we're able to do. Um, our system is API driven and we have very thorough public documentation, which allows us to integrate with other systems as well. So what can you do with it? Well, if you're running out of stock on a certain object that is necessary to keep your machine up and running, we can find you alternative parts that are uh, potentially labeled differently, but um, that we can tell you how close of a match it is. We can take pictures and connect the, the, the maintenance space, uh, something that you have in your hands to what it really means in terms of, of the digital information, or we can even find you common elements. It's, the Air Force na named this uh, multiple substitute, um, suitable substitutes between two different machines. So I can do an intersection, a 3D intersection between elements. Our technology is being used to connect legacy systems to their digital data. So we can then provide all the assets 
and information so that you can do um, import, make decisions on, on manufacturing, repair, and overhaul. Um, and the essence of it is instead of relating to physical data based on proxies like bill of materials or technical drawings or SKUs, we're really liberating and democratizing access to 3D data. Geometry doesn't lie, the DNA provides that linkage. We have good traction uh, with the uh, government, with some large commercial companies and really across the whole industry, inclusive of electronics and even molecules um, are things that we've searched. As long as it's 3D, we're, we're in the game for it. Um, our team is quite varied, uh, executives from large companies like Google and Microsoft, uh, Andy Lloyd uh, comes from uh, from the um, from the Air Force, several years there, helping us. And um, and what we're interested in is to continue to grow our customer base. We're looking for introductions and partnerships. We have an MOU signed with the Air Force already. We're looking for letters of support and continuous innovation. We just scratched the surface on what we really want to do with 3D, and um, and so we're looking for partners there as well. And that's our presentation. Any questions? Awesome. Thank you so much, Ralph. Perfect. So we're opening up the floor for questions. And yeah, feel free to queue them uh, in the order of whoever raises their hand. So I realize the, the audience here is more in the additive manufacturing. Hey, um, one of the projects we're working on right now um, is with a large auto manufacturer where all they want is to get the fixtures, the jigs, and identify them from a picture, creating an electronic catalog. The savings are in the millions of dollars, and we're not even talking about the actual transmissions that they build. We're just talking about the components that are used to manufacture the end, the end product. Um, wherever we look from design and intercepting and design that an engineer is making so that we can show, hey, we're, you already designed something like this, to quoting processes, all the way to maintenance, uh, there's always something 3D and, uh, and I think we apply. Absolutely, Def definitely agreed. Yeah, and it, it just, it, it, I, I've definitely seen some applications because um, just, just within the Air Force, I know that there's, there's been some, definitely some interest just just in finding matching parts that could potentially save for inventories it's just it, it's definitely something worthwhile uh, and that's necessary going forward this Perfect. is a good question uh, sure. Kevin. where has been the the main interest so so far in terms of the customer uh, adoption of this is it is it mostly with with the uh, defense and government or because you could imagine this being useful for yeah, retail companies and all, all kinds of different ones. What, what's the, the main interest so far? Yeah, the, the way I see the world is in four quadrants. Kind of top left quadrant is the consulting companies, McKinsey, uh, KPMG. They, they all are very, very interested in introducing our technology to their existing customers. The manufacturing group, because CAD is what they deal with. Uh, they're just a natural subset of, of, of the industry. The Department of Defense, uh, is, a, is the other group. Takes a while to get going, but they have enormous amounts of need. And then the high-tech companies that are looking just to use our APIs and enhance their own products. So in all four groups, we have activities going on right now. Okay, great. Well, we'll leave you uh, with our contact and we're more than glad to strike a conversation and see where we can take this. Okay, I appreciate your guys' time. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you Thank for you. joining. With that, we're wrapping up the advanced manufacturing as well as uh, additive manufacturing and composite session. And now we are going to move to the, the semiconductors and nanotechnology session. Uh, we are also running late uh, for, for this session. So I'm going to quickly, I'm going to introduce the panel as well as the companies. So for the companies, we're going to start with GSI Technology presenting. Uh, and then after that will be Sunray Scientific, followed by Molier, followed by Optipulse. Uh, in terms of the panel, we're going to be having Peter Holden from North Capital, um, Rajesh from Applied Ventures, Marshall from the DIU, um, Matthew from Fijia Ventures, 
Ann is going to continue with us from Splunk. Takeo is going to be, be continuing with us from the DIC Corporation. And Jacob Bryce is continuing from the Pink Hill Tech Ventures. Uh, first up in the session is GSI Technology. Presenting for GSI will be Mark. Uh, whenever you're ready, feel free to say it. Share your screen. All right. Hello. Can you? Can everyone hear me? <clears throat> I can hear you. All right. Let me come in there and let me get the presentation. Hello, everyone. Thank you for your time this afternoon. Let me. Okay, can we see the uh, presentation there? Yeah. I can see the about slide. Okay, very good. <clears throat> then I'll get right into it. Is that good, Asher? Sounds good to me. Okay. Hello, everyone. So uh, my name is Mark Wright. I am a Director of uh, Technical Marketing at uh, GSI. I'm speaking today for uh, Neil Sampson, who was uh, going to be presenting. Um, <clears throat> so GSI is a 27-year-old um, company. It's a world leader in <clears throat> SRAM technology. They've got the uh, most dense devices and the fastest devices on the market. And um, what the company did was they took that design team and expertise and created a um, AI cool processor um, from that, that we call an associative processing unit here. And so this device, um, this is what we're gonna talk about uh, today. And uh, my ask is for uh, partners um, both to sign an MOU and a letter of support um, with us for SBIRs um, and also for, uh, uh, manufacturing or integration partners that uh, we can build more integrated solutions with this. So this is what we're going to talk about. And the APU, based on what it was, uh, what its technology it's built on, does um, adopt some of the behavior or some of the characteristics of the SRAM. So the very high speed, uh, very low power, and we're at early uh, stages of testing, but also uh, uh, radiation immunity, which makes it uh, suitable also for space applications. <clears throat> the device itself is a uh, compute in memory um, part, and it's architected, I'm sorry, I'm going to try to minimize the pictures here. Um, okay, there we go. So <clears throat> it's architected in a number of rows where each row has uh, 24 cells of memory that you would store your uh, database, for instance, in. Um, now, uh, all cells within this uh, row of 24 can be read simultaneously, uh, which provides a NAND function during a read. And the uh, result register for that read also has a Boolean logic uh, built into it. So the uh, result of this is that a read and a write also performs two simultaneous Boolean operations. So the chip itself has 2 million of these bit line processors um, inside of it and then has the ability to compute by content at a uh, rate of one petaboolean operations uh, per second. So you can compare this to a very high end uh, GPU that would have uh, thousands of um, 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 compute engines uh, in, in it. So the primary use cases we go after with the technology right now are the real time search of an AI workload. Um, and also uh, high performance parallel computing. And some of the applications that we've looked at that I'm um, talking about today are SAR processing for which we have an off the shelf solution, um, image processing, for instance, that's the outcome of the SAR uh, picture, uh, human and object recognition and uh, object re-identification. So some of the applications you can see in terms of vertical uh, use cases um, that we could partner with, uh, with companies for. So if I look at SAR, and this presentation is available, I'm just jumping through quickly due to time. If we look at the SAR um, performance, we can do a SAR picture on one card in about one fifth the time of a high-end GPU um, and simultaneously at one third the power. So if we put, um, if we take these cards and then build a server out of these, a 1U uh, server which can fit into a drone, um, you can see we get real time, uh, near real time performance in terms of uh, uh, SAR um, creation, the SAR picture creation. Okay. Oops, there we go. 
It's another application, dense registration. So this is for applications where maybe you're, it's in a uh, GPS uh, denial environment and we're using uh, just photographs uh, um, of the environment to navigate uh, the device, whether it's a drone or an airplane. Um, okay. Here we're looking at uh, object recognition. So what happens is uh, similar to the last speaker, we're, we vectorize um, everything. Uh, to us, we're at this point, we're, a, we're just a vector processor, a, high, a very high speed vector processor. So we can um, take a picture and distinguish various items from um, within that picture into its categories and output them or look for a very specific um, uh, item within that picture. And we can do this at a billion scale database in uh, less than 50 milliseconds. So we can do this in real time. Okay, <clears throat> this is uh, talking about change detection. Um, and so in change detection, similarly, we um, average the, uh, the reference uh, vectors, right? And so what we're, uh, when we do the search, we're giving actual change detection. So this compares to a traditional uh, uh, pixel by pixel comparison where you may get uh, changes which are not of interest, right? Leaves moving or, or trees blowing um, and the like. Okay, one other item from here is because we vectorize and we search for categories within this, we can do something called zero shot learning um, where you can add a new category that you wanna search on or a new object you wanna search on without having to retrain the entire database. Um, so what you would do is you would just enter that uh, new vector. So the current product, warning. okay, thank you. The, yep. um, of course we have the chip, um, we have off the shelf, uh, PCI Express cards and an SSD card. And then we also integrate these cards into servers that we, uh, that we sell. A um, Couple of competitions we've, uh, we've won recently. So the Moffett Radar Challenge, which was distinguishing between humans and animals from radar. And also the Mosaic Challenge, which was really a uh, active shooter, real time friend versus foe identification, as well as any weapons that uh, um, foes may be carrying. Um, again, what we were looking for and thank you for your time. Perfect, thank you so much, Mark. Okay. All right, so uh, feel free to raise your hands. Uh, we'll answer them in the order that they are raised. Okay, Takeo, go ahead. Hey, happy to. So yeah, I'm not so familiar with the iPhone. Yeah. Um, so could you explain a little bit more, like your value proposition again? The differentiation yes. from the other companies. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So the value, pro the primary value uh, proposition on the device is the ability to do uh, high performance computing um, on very large uh, workloads, um, very you know at high speed and at very low power. So the two. Um, value proposition from an application perspective is either moving workloads, which are normally in the enterprise, into actual mobile environments, uh, right? So we're not talking about like uh, uh, tiny ML or, or things like that. We're talking the actual AI workloads that we're running in an enterprise, but being able to put that into a vehicle um, and, and running that, right? So one differentiator, for instance, on the airplane example with the SAR, right now an airplane may go out and do a SAR uh, sweep looking for fires, let's say, right? In a forest uh, situation. The uh, airplane would come back from the sortie, the data would then go in, be crunched, and then maybe several hours or several days later, you find out, you know, this was the result. But if you're looking for fires, the, the paradigm shift now is we can detect if there's smoke while the plane's flying. And if that happens, the pilot can be uh, war, uh, alerted, the plane can turn around and do a higher resolution sweep while we're still in flight, right? So that's the, that's the, that's the change in paradigm that this enables. Uh, the second proposition is we do allow much higher density of workload so we can lower power um, footprints in enterprises, right? So we can do more with the resources that are already in an enterprise. Okay, thank you. One more question. So the, uh, so the, I think lower, like the in energy is definitely there is a demand, but are there like any like smaller size uh, demand or something like lighter weight? Uh, the professor uh, demand 
Uh, I'm sorry, the audio is not coming very well. I heard, can you rephrase uh, that? Sorry. I heard... uh, yeah, the, uh, yeah the, uh, the, uh, understand the, uh, the, the saving the energy is a really important part. And uh, like, uh, also, are there like any trend or any uh, requirements from the customer about the, like, making this small, smaller uh, tip? Yes. Or, okay, okay. Yes. Yeah, good question. Thank you. So it, it, the question is, can it, uh, are there um, requirements for smaller? Yes, particularly because um, uh, GPUs right now have a difficulty for, in space environments. And so with the explosion of applications for satellites in space, we've seen interest um, in that use application, even for CubeSats, right? So imagine being able to get your result while you're taking samples. And so that limit reduces the amount of data you have to send because you can send the result now rather than raw data. Um, so to address that, we are looking, we're, in, we're into a design of a second generation chip we're taping out in um, about two months. But that design also allows us to license out uh, module, modular portions of the device for smaller use cases. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. All right, Anne and then Rajesh. Uh, yeah, hi. Thanks so much, Mark, for the presentation. Um, if I understood you correctly, uh, your company is publicly traded. If so, um, and uh, uh, sounds like a direct uh, competitor to NVIDIA. Um, what are you What are you seeking for uh, from all of us here on the panel today? Thanks. Uh, thank you, Anne, for your question. Yeah, we are. Um, it is a public company or traded under GSIT. Uh, we're kind of a cooperation with uh, Nvidia if you will so for AI workloads um, we would use a uh, we would use a GPU for the training portion right so maybe at base you would train on the database you want to search but on the actual real-time usage the GPU isn't as um, uh, effective so so we we uh, uh, really show on the search on the real-time search um, area uh, on the GPU side the um, the, the ask that we have is um, we have the space technology. Uh, we, need, uh, we need integrators. We want to work with integrators who could integrate this into applications that they're doing. So maybe someone who has expertise um, you know, in object recognition or navigation or SAR, uh, we can speed that up or make it near real time. For instance, in, into integration into a, um, uh, a flight platform or, you know, or the like. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. There was Mark, a, a couple of yes. questions. Yeah. Um, is is your in-memory compute device still SRAM based, or is it the old DNA of the company? No, it's uh, it it is SRAM based. Uh, okay. It's a larger SRAM cell. So we so the associative portion comes because we also implement a we have a TCAM capability, a ternary content addressable. So when you're doing this, if you have, for instance, a billion entry database um, <clears throat> vectorized and stored in the in the device, when we search, part of what makes us fast is we discount anything that would, wouldn't apply to the search uh, because of that ternary um, uh, nature. Not sure I understand that, but I was just curious about, um, sorry, uh, SM densities are not really that competitive when you compare them to flash or DRAM memory densities, right? So do you actually have the, are your chips really giant or can you actually manufacture these chips to store enough data that you would need to store? Good question. Yeah, so the re the way we do this is we vectorize everything. So similar to the okay. um, last, um, uh, we, we basically create a integer vector and the device okay. itself being a memory, there's no limit, there's no word definition, right? So we could have, we've applied the search capability to medical where we've mm -hmm. given them a 2000 bit word, um, right? We can go to, you know, Typically for searches, people use 768 bit vectors. So we have a okay. word of 768. So it's all dynamic. Um, okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, that, that wraps up the time. Um, Very good. Thank you, Asher. Absolutely. Feel free to leave some, some of your contact info in the chat so that anyone who had more questions, and it actually looks like someone in the chat is asking to speak with you. Um, so already, um, that, that's great. So next up, we have Sunray Scientific presenting with Pete Matu. Um, the floor is yours. Hello, 
Hello, can everyone hear me? This is Madhu Stemmerman. I can hear you. Fantastic. And you can see my screen, correct? Yeah, I can see it. I've been talking to myself, but I can see it. Okay, wonderful. All right, thank you. Hello, I'm Madhu Stemmerman, CEO of Sunray Scientific. We are a leading edge electronic materials company that basically makes flexible wearable electronics possible. Simply put, we are the super conductive glue for electronic devices. What we'd like to do today is we are looking for partnerships. We're looking for government partnerships as well as commercial partnerships. You'll see that we've done a lot of work with grants and with our customers to really increase our TRL and MRL of our technology. Our production ready patented technology is being qualified today on six consumer products at Fortune 500 companies, each of these having the potential to generate tens of millions of dollars in revenue for our company. So electronic technology is really approaching a true inflection point Circuitry, which is the basic engine of electronics, has been confined by limitations of size and durability. We are seeing electronics moving to wearable, flexible, and smart, and that's where we come into play. The boundaries are being pushed specifically for flexible hybrid electronics, and with our innovative proprietary adhesive technology, we've broken those boundaries. So how many of you would want to wear this on your arm? Traditional circuit boards, they're just not flexible nor durable enough to handle the stresses of everyday life. In addition, if you look at the manufacturing processes, they are cumbersome, they're harsh, and they're capital intensive. So without a clear solution, electronics manufacturers have been stuck. With our solution, we enable this to work. So basically our conductive adhesive replaces solder or traditional means of making electrical interconnects. We're attaching microchips that withstand rigorous flexing. We've actually developed and patented not only the formulation of the material, but also the process where we're growing microscopic wires exactly where they're needed, whether it's on plastics, on curved surfaces or textiles. Our solution enables smaller, lighter, and more durable electronics, is more cost-effective, environmentally friendly, and can be produced domestically. We've gained the attention of Fortune 500 companies. They're actually paying us for the commercial development work that we're doing, definitely seeing value in our technology, making a, us a prime target for either partnerships and or acquisitions. So here's a myriad of value proposition that we are hearing from our customers. One is that we can go across many different applications, whether it's flexible, rigid, bare die attach, semiconductor packaging. The beauty of our technology is that we are improving performance while taking out costs. And we're doing that by eliminating process steps in manufacturing, making it much simpler. We also don't require high temperatures nor pressure because we're basically using a magnetic field that allows that electrical connection to be made where, where others are just not able to make it. Um, so this talks a bit about the size. So basically, if we look at the flexible electronics, the TAM is expected to grow from $18 billion in 2020 to 41 billion in just five years. Our portion, the serviceable obtainable market is about $1 billion. And yes, we do have competition. As I referred to solder in the past, we have competition from both old and new technologies. However, there's nothing out there like what we have. And we are cost-effective, we're scalable, we're production ready now. This, is, this technology has been in the works since the 60s and we've cracked that nut. Companies such as Henkel and Molex, some of you I'm sure are aware of them, they're very big companies, right? They're multi-billion dollar global suppliers of materials, advanced materials or electronics, and they're very excited about our products. They've actually conducted testing, reliability testing across many applications and have seen the performance. So we are currently generating revenue with 16 customer qualification engagements 
Three of them are targeted to commercialize by Q1 of 2023 of next year. We're currently engaged with a medical device manufacturer. It's a continuous glucose monitor where based on the calculations, we've demonstrated that this could lead to $50 million of annual material sales that would start in 2026. I'm going to skip this. So basically for the last five years, we've really refined our technology with a focus on federal grants. We've been very fortunate with the Air Force, with the Department of Energy. We have brought in over six and a half million dollars in non-dilutive funding. Now several of our products are coming out of testing with very strong results. So it's really time for us to gear up for production. We did just close a two and a half million dollar seed round. We were oversubscribed. We're now gearing up for our Series A round, targeting a $10 million raise. And we are very fortunate to have an industry experience team, 13 very highly dedicated full-time employees, along with an active advisory team whom are all investors. And I'll now take questions. Thank you so much, Madhu. Perfect. Go ahead, Kev. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, one in the uh, like, are there any um, challenges uh, to apply the wide range of the application except the uh, uh, medical and uh, flexible uh, use? And the second one is the uh, your um, technology is applicable for um, like the, uh, another like resin. Uh, like, I think you are using the specific resin, but uh, like. So different like acrylic resin or the other like polymers is that applicable for your technology that's the second sure. question yes so um so first off from let's say the um the challenges that we experience is that um especially for semiconductor packaging the requirement is as you may know it's very fine pitch today we've been able to demonstrate down to 100 micron pad pitch no problem um, we've even experienced and shown some capability at the 50, 60 micron pad pitch, but it's not consistent. Our goal over the next nine to 12 months, and we're looking for partnerships, is to get down to less than 20 micron pad pitch. Um, we're actually working on a project through the Air Force, AFRL, um, that is with Teledyne Judson to do just that. So that's one. Two is that we are a disruptive technology. We've done a, a really great job in integrating our technology into an existing SMT process. So that is a big benefit. We're using a magnet plate that we've basically patented. And um, initially I will say it was a challenge to get our customers to think about introducing a magnet plate. They just want material, but because of the ease in, in uh, basically transferring that technology into SMT, it's, um, it's really eliminated that challenge. Um, very quickly on your second question, the beauty of our technology is that we can take our particle technology, which are ferromagnetic particles, and in essence, utilize many different resin systems. We have fine-tuned and come up with something that's optimal that works, but I will say that we are working with partnerships and large material companies to use their resin um, mixtures to use our technology as well. Great. Thank you so much. Perfect. Peter, would you mind asking your question in person or do you want me to read it? No, no. Sorry. I just re realized where you can raise your hand. So apologies. Uh, yeah, I, I'm working with a couple of solar panel companies that are using non-silicon solutions like perovskite. And um, obviously they do uh, like silk screen or inkjet printing. I'm very interested to find a solution for the interconnects that are not ITOs, which show up obviously visibly. Mm -hmm. uh, or very expensive or have toxic materials in them. So have you looked at transparent interconnection? Are you developing anything in this area? Not transparent. Um, I will say there is some color to our material. Uh, we do have a UV curable version that, um, that we are looking at. But um, Peter, what I would say, you know, I think it would be great to talk offline and understand the requirements and um, see if we can come up with a solution because we are, we customize solutions as much as we want to, you know, really standardize, but for nice size opportunities, we are looking to also commercial, you know, come up with custom solutions that can commercialize. Great. Yeah, we'll do. Thank you. Awesome. Perfect. Perfect. 
Thank you so much, Madhu. That was fantastic. And feel free to leave your contact information in the chat um, so that, you know, Peter can, can get in contact with you or anyone else. Um, fantastic. So next up is Molia. And the floor is yours, Josh. Wonderful. Hi, everyone. Thanks for, uh, for joining today. And thanks uh, for allowing me to present about Moliere and introduce Nanobubble technology to you all. Uh, you guys can all see my screen okay? Yeah. Great. Okay, so just a quick snapshot of uh, who we are as a company. Um, so we have uh, just closed a Series B um, led by Apollo. Um, we have 2,000 commercial installations in almost 40 countries around the world. Uh, we're treating, I had to do the math on this before this presentation, uh, over 3 million cubic meters of water a day, which translates to about 800 million gallons of water per day, um, growing quite rapidly with several patents uh, and just over 100 employees, or just under 100 employees, and we look to be uh, double that in the next year. So think of nanobubbles as a platform technology. Uh, nanobubbles are basically going to enable water to do more with less. Um, and that applies to almost anything you can imagine that water touches, anything from agriculture, aquaculture, water treatment from an industrial, municipal, drinking water, anytime where water is being used in uh, resource extraction uh, and potentially even the ability to replace chemicals like chlorine in pools and spas uh, and many, many more. We primarily focus today um, in several sectors, agriculture, aquaculture, wastewater treatment, uh, lake and pond management, and uh, natural resources, where we can see uh, crop increases of over 50% in certain circumstances, where we can make oxygen uh, affordable for aquaculture facilities to improve uh, both yield of, uh, of fish as well as uh, improve the actual environment to make it more sustainable. We can reduce energy consumption from wastewater treatment plants by up to 40%. And when you think about wastewater treatment plants actually taking up about 2% of all global energy, that is moves the needle. Um, and we're also used to restore uh, water bodies now in over 250 uh, lakes around the world. So what are nanobubbles? Nanobubbles are uh, bubbles that are 2,500 times smaller than a grain of salt. Um, they're actually about the size of a virus, which we are all, all too familiar with these days. Um, at that size, they behave unlike any bubble you've ever seen, in part because they are invisible to the naked eye. But more interestingly, they are so small that they actually lack sufficient buoyancy to rise to the surface and pop. And as a result of that, they can actually stay suspended in the fluid uh, for weeks to months, depending on the, the media of that fluid which allows them to behave a lot more like a form of chemistry than a bubble that you would normally think about. And so the properties of both gas transfer as well as the actual charge of the bubble itself become very interesting for various applications. Nanobubbles themselves um, are hydrophobic. They have a charged surface. They have a high internal pressure. They have a hard surface. Um, and we have a very, very high gas transfer efficiency. As a result, um, they can participate in many different processes. Um, they can be used to uh, serve as an oxidant and uh, reduce surface tension, which is many, many different applications uh, that I touched on before and many others as well. In terms of how Moliere specifically generates nanobubbles. So we have several patents around our uh, method of production. Uh, but generally speaking, we are going to take flowing water, either existing flow or create flow ourselves, manipulate the, uh, the water uh, to basically control the fluid and the gas dynamics to create uh, millions of nano-sized particles per milliliter. Um, and depending on the application, we will either do that in a single pass or in a recirculation loop. So if you imagine this tank of water having a recirc through the pump, our core technology is really all that's needed so if you have an inline system with flowing water, we're very easy to do a plug and play system where we have uh, wastewater treatment plants that will have an entire system integrated in just a matter of a few hours. We've designed different products. If we go back and think that 
if ultimately all we need is flowing water to go through this product, what we've done is we've designed actual uh, finished products based on the application to serve the industry need. So for instance, a lake may not need pure oxygen for the benefit of the nanobubble, but a high-end greenhouse in Europe will want high-end oxygen concentrators and a lot more data to actually be able to control the system. But these systems are much smaller than, for instance, large-scale municipal systems. So we package our core technology at different flow rates with different uh, bells and whistles to make sure that we're ultimately driving uh, results for the customer based on their needs. And in terms of the business itself, we have four different uh, modes of uh, revenue models. Uh, our largest today is our system sales, where we'll sell a piece of capital equipment either through distribution or direct to customers. Uh, I lead all of our work on uh, partnerships. So any time that Nanobubbles can enhance the process of let's say a home appliance where Moliere may not decide to uh, launch a washing machine, but we may put a nanobubble generator inside of a washing machine. So I'll, we'll work with partners to actually incorporate nanobubble technology into their existing processes. Uh, we'll also offer nanobubbles as a service, uh, service-based contracts with uh, municipalities uh, pr primarily. And then we also offer monitoring and aftermarket uh, support as well. So we are uh, very open to looking at new opportunities and applications where nanobubbles can provide unique value. Um, and I look forward to, uh, to answering any of your questions. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much. All right. We have one in the chat already. Um, why are pH control or surfactants needed? Why are pH control or surfactants needed? So surfactants, uh, start with that one first. Surfactants are, think of it as soap. So we've all been using a lot more soap than, uh, <laughs> than we are pH control or surfactants needed. Ah, thank you for clarifying that. Uh, no, the answer is they are not. Um, in fact, the reason I was thinking about surfactants is we actually are able to help remove surfactants in wastewater treatment plants, which then enables the infrastructure to be far more uh, efficient in terms of delivering oxygen uh, with the existing infrastructure. pH is not needed to be controlled, although we can influence pH if you were to, for instance, inject CO2 nanobubbles to bring it the pH down. But yeah, we can work with any, any liquid, any gas. We have people doing everything from clean water to wastewater to uh, produced, uh, produced water from oil extraction um, and virtually any gas source that you can imagine. And is our solution super saturated with gas? Yes, we can super saturate uh, solutions with gas. Our uh, horticulture customers, this is actually their primary uh, mode of interest is to be able to efficiently inject oxygen into their irrigation water. Um, so we're able to help farmers get oxygen levels over 30 parts per million, which they would not be able to achieve with any other technology. Sure. Peter, go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Um, first of all, I really like what you're doing. And it's like uh, you've got to the boundaries of difference between chemical separation and physical separation, which is really an interesting area. I was wondering, um, on, on that point, uh, can you use your technology to separate um, or activate the hydrite in solutions for things like desalination or biomass or hydrogen separation from methane, which is really the nucleation of the hydrite problem? So it's very funny you ask that. Um, I don't want to get out of my depth from a technical perspective, but as an example, I was on the phone earlier with UC Davis about applying this to reduce methane emissions in yeah. wastewater lagoons. Uh, so the answer is theoretically yes, but we have not actually gone out to prove that specifically. Okay. Yeah, we have a, an investment in uh, uh, basically uh, um, desalination using active membranes. And one of the challenges is the membranes clog up. So we're looking at potentially solutions to unclog this in real time, but very high volumes of water. And this could be an interesting discussion. Yeah, Peter, I love, would love to maybe follow up afterwards. Our, uh, our CEO um, and chairman of the board both are from the RO membrane world. So it's been on our hit list for a while. And if there's a, a, a need currently, we'd be happy to have that discussion. Right. 
fantastic. Thanks. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much, Josh. That was fantastic. Sure. Uh, feel free to leave your contact information in the chat. Um, next up, we have John Joseph of OptiPulse. John, feel free to share your screen on your end whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you. Uh, appreciate it. And uh, let's see, I believe I'm ready now. So, um, hi, my name is John Joseph. I'm the CEO of OptiPulse. Uh, OptiPulse uh, has created a new photonic technology. Uh, it's a light source that is uh, made up of tiny lasers, but the lasers are incoherent with each other, which gives it incredible uh, attributes. And uh, um, we have, we believe we've created the ideal optical wireless photonic uh, source. Uh, it's inexpensive. It's invisible and eye safe. Uh, we can change the divergence angle of it. Um, it has higher bandwidth than fiber itself. Have, it has an extremely small form factor, as you can see. Uh, it uses much less energy than microwave sources for data. Uh, it's radiation hardened and space qualifiable. High, it, uh, higher powers are available and very inexpensive. Uh, beams are steerable without mechanical apparatus that propagates through the atmosphere farther than a, re than a coherent laser, and it has the ability to be protected by, uh, from EMP. Uh, so we have uh, fabricated these chips, designed them, fabricated, patented them. We actually have nine issued patents from the USPTO now and a lot, a lot of uh, PCTs, foreign filings. Um, and uh, these chips were actually produced in a production foundry. Uh, this chip that you're looking at on uh, right here in your finger has 37 lasers on it, and uh, uh, it has it's a back emitter. These are lenses that are actually etched on a wafer scale, so that makes these uh, basically we can produce that for one dollar. Uh, there's 20,000 on a four inch wafer, so uh, the the ability to uh, to put this into use cases uh, reduces the cost of uh, many different systems. Uh, we have evaluation boards that we are testing currently, and uh, we have had an NSF funded SBIR for non-mechanical beam steering where we were successful and we're going into phase two on that. Uh, we have uh, demonstrated by putting this little chip into a box, a crude uh, mechanical steer box. Uh, we have uh, put this, this this system across two buildings at over 100 meters, and we've got a full 10 gigabit per second full duplex uh, from this. The interesting thing we found is that when we plug in a 10 gigabit per second fiber into this to send it, uh, this was the uh, actual fiber um, bit error rate, which is fairly bad. Uh, it's one time 10 to the minus eight um, bit error rate. But uh, as it went through our system, it cleaned it up dramatically because the speed of our lasers and detectors. And uh, we retime it coming out, which is almost ideal. This does not happen in the RF world. If you get noise, you amplify noise. Uh, so from that, uh, we believe that what we really found with this demonstration is that what we really need is a uh, the ability to move the beam around and align it, and uh, um, that that's with all uh, line of sight um, wireless sources is the most difficult part of the um, of the link is to keep it aligned, align it, and keep it aligned. And so we we have patented a new. Uh, technique uh, for smart poles, which is a 3D printing of type of the smart poles. Uh, and we can imagine a mesh network of these uh, where poles are talking to other poles. Um, and so if any connections go down, it uh, automatically reconnects into a mesh network. And uh, we're able to um, 3D print these, all of the alignments in a single pole, maybe 20 to 50 different alignments can be printed all at once uh, through an AI program in a 3D point cloud uh, with all elevations and angles um, printed into the device. And then we would snap our uh, cards into each alignment for uh, that current alignment. And uh, we're in the middle of a NSF um, a program in order to do this $160 million grant, uh, we were um, uh, 
we were uh, approved for the concept letter and we're uh, putting together an engine, a uh, regional innovation engine um, with that. Now, why is this important? It's because uh, really, if you look at um, 5G millimeter wave, which is also line of sight, uh, it is it actually single channel is less than 200 megabits per second. And uh, our single channel is over 10 gigabits per second. Our chips are actually testing to 25 gigabits per second. We're using 10 gigabits per second now because of the support chips that are off the shelf and easy to get to. Uh, this is our staff from Sandia National Labs. We all worked together over 30 years ago, uh, These uh, the three of us here, and uh, we were the, some of the first ones to optimize actual fiber optic uh, Vixels for uh, fiber optic communication. When we started, it was at a, around a gigabit per second or less, and we've brought it way up past then. So a uh, very experienced team, um, and uh, we have been approved for the uh, regional innovation engine. Um, we, uh, in that engine, uh, we are to uh, put together a number of other technologies with ours in order to um, put this together, and uh, we are uh, planning that right now. So uh, thank you very much. Now, uh, we have uh, taken four and a half million dollars of investment. Um, I, the reason why I did not put a slide in here for our ask is uh, we are uh, really looking at splitting up this because this device is a is really a platform technology in many use cases. Uh, LIDAR, uh, short distance, long distance space uh, and directed energy. And so we are uh, splitting up our company so that our value is not high. It can be low for uh, venture capital uh, investment. So if you would like to uh, talk to us about it, please, um, please contact me. Thank you. I'm opening it up for questions. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, John. That was fantastic. Thank you. Okay, well, um, I will stop sharing and uh, uh, I'll put so I'll, my. I'll, I'll kick it off. Okay. So, aside from from just, you know, what what kind of use cases can we expect from from this technology? So, is it satellites we're talking about? Is it you know, let's say telephone telephone wires in places where the terrain is rough? Um, what's 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 the best most promising use case that you you'd, you'd want to talk about? Um, the most promising uh, use case really is space communications. Uh, yeah. One of the attributes that we have um, is um, actually, whoops, I got my uh, wrong email in there with somebody else's, so I'll put it in here. Uh, basically, we have the ability to add power to eat that chip by adding lasers to it, and our tests, our data show that we can add power without reducing the speed or we there is no penalty in frequency response. So that means that we can even get an, into the kilowatts um, of power uh, with these photonic sources and really compete with like Starlink um, at an order of magnitude faster and better energy. Uh, these are about one tenth of the power usage of uh, microwaves, um, and it's about uh, at least ten times faster. Uh, so this is a much more efficient and faster way to do a, a line of sight link. Sure, absolutely, yeah, and I'm sure, I'm sure it makes a lot of sense. Someone asked in the chat, how is the performance affected by weather? Yes, thank you for that question. So um, we expand the beam. Uh, the way that this works is that uh, there is a, a very unique patented ability to add some, all of the beams together behind the chip. And what happens is the beams expand as they go out. And so the, the whole beam is actually just a single beam when it comes out of the lens. When it comes out of the lens, which is about a four or five inch uh, DOE, a, directive, um, a diffractive optical element, it actually is eye safe. And what happens in weather is with, when rain or, or any kind of snow or anything gets in, the, uh, gets in, uh, in front of that beam, it actually doesn't stop the beam. It only takes microseconds to get over to the receiver. So in any one instance, there's only a few snowflakes or 
uh, raindrops in that um, in that beam at the time. And we saw a massive rainstorm while we had that 10 gigabit per second link and there was absolutely no, uh, no degrading in performance. Now there is in fog. And so we have to bring in uh, the uh, distance in fog, but uh, we do have calculations uh, that show that we are much better at propagating through the atmosphere than a coherent laser. Sure, absolutely. Thank you so much, John. And that, thank you. Yeah, that's the time. Um, perfect. For our last presentation tonight, we have Bot Factory. Um, George, floor is yours. Whenever you're ready to share. Okay. Let's see. Is the picture and the sound coming in properly? Yep, yeah. yeah, it okay. looks good to me. Okay, fantastic. Hello, everyone. I'm George Kiriakou from Board Factory, and I want to show some of the very cool things that we do here. So at Board Factory, we manufacture and sell those magical machines that fabricate electronics from different materials under different conditions automatically at almost any location, from the lab to the middle of the desert, in the middle of the ocean, and hopefully very soon in space. How does this happen? It's as simple as one, two, three. In reality, we begin with, uh, with the design of the circuit board. Uh, people that design electronics uh, use CAD software to create this, and then traditionally they send it to manufacturer. For our case, they simply upload it to our machine that sits on the desk next to them. They click print and assemble, and after a couple of hours, they have the finished product on their desk. The, the process is very simple, really. We begin with printing electroconductive nanoparticle silver-based inks for the conductive material, and then insulating material to print the dielectric, then again conductive, and so on and so forth, to complete the multi-layer PCB board. Then we have the pasting process, where we extrude electroconductive paste, solder paste, where the components are going to be. And finally, the pick and place picks up the components, shows them to the camera, it uses the onboard machine vision system, corrects any error and places them on the board. Everything is heat cured and you have your prototype in your hands. Why is this a big problem and suddenly becomes uh, more and more burning? The last two years, I'm pretty sure you all know, there have been issues with that, where we get our electronics. Traditionally, manufacturing and fabricated in Asia, supply chain issues, we get in the chips from Taiwan, red earth metal issues with uh, coming from Russia, Ukraine, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a big push into bringing fabrication of uh, electronics from PCBs to the chips back in US soil. And uh, that's why the CHIPS Act probably you've heard has been approved recently. It comes then to no surprise that the vast majority of our customers uh, is actually comprised from the DOD from big corporations that they have strong R&D branches and from research institutions uh, you know, from the biggest universities uh, in the US and off the planet. Why are these people buying our machines? Well, the, the benefits uh, we cover pretty much, obviously the acceleration in speed, you go from a couple of weeks to get your boards to a couple of hours. You do not have to send your files anywhere. Everything is kept in-house, uh, avoiding IT theft. Of course, uh, we have the advantage that there is uh, no red tape. You don't need any more, you know, purchasing, budgeting, shipping, importing, or whatever. You don't have to worry about counterfeits, et cetera, et cetera. Two examples of uh, what we did uh, through the, the groundwork that we recently concluded was with the uh, US Air Force. They have a big facility where they manufacture the PCBs on site in order to try to mitigate all the things that we said before. However, these are huge facilities with big chemical baths, specialized personnel that needs to operate these things uh, day on, day off. So we actually developed a machine that aims to replace this entire manufacturing floor with a single machine that creates their electronics on site. Something similar we did with Airbus and other big manufacturers, either airspace or car manufacturers in Germany, to create what we call the factory of the future, pretty much under a single roof, streamline the entire manufacturing process to take a product from inception to production. Um, and um, these, all these things are what we have achieved so far, exciting and all. However, to my opinion, the biggest exciting 
things are coming up ahead. Uh, for example, we currently print PCBs. Nothing stops us from taking it one step further and going to component fabrication. Component fabrication, we mean from passive components, resistors, capacitors, we, which we actually, we can manufacture additively right now with our machine, all the way to active components, chips. Of course, it's an order of magnitude or two lower in scale. However, in functionality, nothing stops you from doing this. Going to optoelectrical interconnects, that means our machine is a material agnostic. The same way that we print electroconductive and dielectric inks, we can actually print inks that they can behave like an optical fiber. Right now, as we move to quantum computing, the metal traces cannot carry the amount of information that we produce. So right now, we connect out of the board with optical fiber. However, we can actually print materials that embed the optical fibers in the PCB exactly as we do right now with the silver traces. And of course, as I passed a little bit before, uh, remote fabrication provides operational readiness. And it's very important when we're talking about remote locations. But of course, it's a different level and a different game when we're talking about in-space manufacturing where there is no alternative if there is a failure or if there is a need for a repair or an upgrade. Actually, as of recently, we just got awarded with a US Space Force grant just to examine the potentials of this use case. Now, why are we here today and what we need is we have done a big push lately for grants with the DOD. And of course, this is an ongoing effort. So any collaborations, any MOUs, and any potential use cases, we're always interested. We are slowly preparing for our Series A at the end of the year and the beginning of the next. So definitely we're looking for interest there. And of course, any, any uh, help that uh, can be provided into pushing this technology forward and uh, making people aware of the huge benefits of such a technology is always beneficial to us. Um, this is it. This is Border Factory. Any questions? More than glad to answer. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, Anne, go right ahead. Anne, can you hear me? Uh, really appreciate it. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah, I was muted. Um, yeah, hi, George. Hey, thanks for the um, presentation. Um, so two, I guess, questions. One, uh, where are you guys headquartered? And then two, you said you have 400 plus beta customers are all of those or tell me what percentage of those are paid customers and then how many of those 400 plus beta customers do you envision uh, going full enterprise commercial with you thanks absolutely um so let's begin with the first one we are based in new york city um second question uh, regarding the the beta i can understand how this can be misleading all of them are paid customers for the last uh, four years we have made our products commercially available so everybody who is buying uh, who is using our machine is a paid customer both for the equipment and for the consumables and when we're developing a technology for example for the air force or airbus all of these are paying customers However, why do we call them uh, better? Because um, you can imagine that until I would say late last year, we, we always uh, consider this technology as under heavy development. And even now we're pushing software updates every, every two weeks. We create uh, hardware upgrades all the time that we offer as upgrades to, to our customers. So now finally we are at the stage where we consider the technology mature and we are at it for almost a decade now. And for the first four years, it was pure R&D. For the second four years, it was R&D at sales at the, time, at the same time. Now we're at the stage where you know, the technology is mature enough and we're ready to scale it up. So sorry for the confusion, this uh, beta word in the cost. I, I hope I answered the question. Yes, you did. Thank you so much. Does it does the last question, does the technology require on site uh, implementation or can this all be done remotely? <laughs> so uh, just to be clear, right, we we sell the, the machine that you install where you want the, the fabrication of those circuits to, to take place. Now, whether you need somebody physically there or not, uh, I have to say it depends. For example, the, the product that we have commercially available on our website 
it does require somebody to be there because you know you you have to load the cartridges for example or something like that however part of the work that we did with air force was that okay can we make it completely automatic that you press a button and you walk away and uh, yeah we did that i mean it's a, it's always a matter of uh, of cost so um it, it is not uh, at a stage where I believe it can be supported by the market yet, but this is what we have been doing all these years. We develop the, the R&D work, and once it matures enough, it gets pushed to, to the sales channel. So, yeah, it is possible to be completely off hands. However, the, the commercially available solution that we have right now does require limited supervision. Thank you. Okay, so... There's one question in the chat from John Joseph. Um, what frequency is your PCB boards qualified for or able to propagate? That is a, a brilliant question because we're talking about inkjet. So if you take the microscope and you, you look at the traces, it's like, you know, you, you literally spray micro droplets. So definitely it does not give you the super sharp edge that you see under the microscope, um, the microscope with etching. Uh, so it has ragged edges, which causes uh, trouble in the very high frequencies. However, up to five gigahertz, we have actually done the, the measurements. You, you don't have any problem. As you go further up in the frequencies, you start having issues. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Fantastic. Fantastic. If there's no more questions, then uh, thank you, everyone who decided to join today's showcase. It's been an absolute pleasure having you. Um, if you guys have any questions, want to be more involved in the showcases, um, want to get in touch with us, want the recording, anything, I'm putting my email in the chat. It's just asher at dtechshowcase.com. Uh, happy to help out wherever we can. And again, I'd like to thank all of the panelists and all of the companies that presented today. And, that asked engaging questions today. You you guys really enabled this to be a fantastic event. So thank you everyone. And uh, I look forward to seeing you at the next one at the Space Showcase in October. Thank, thank you, you so much, Asher. Yeah, yeah thank you, Asher. Great, great job again. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, George. Bye, panelists. Bye. Yeah. See you guys. No problem, John. Have a good one. Okay, thanks. You too. Man. Thank you. Bye-bye. Absolutely. Absolutely. No problem, Yannis.